This is the Thursday, September 21st, 2023 afternoon session of the Portland City Council. Rebecca, it's good to have you here. Please call the roll. Gonzalez? Here. Maps? Here. Rubio? Here. Ryan? Here. Wheeler? Here. Now we'll hear from legal counsel on the rules of order and decorum. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Mayor. <coughs> Welcome to the Portland City Council. To testify before council in person or virtually, you must sign up in advance on the council agenda at www.portland.gov slash council slash agenda. Information on engaging with city council can be found on the council clerk's webpage. The presiding officer preserves order and decorum during city council meetings. The presiding officer determines the length of testimony. Individuals generally have three minutes to testify unless otherwise stated. Timer will indicate when your time is done. Disruptive conduct such as shouting, refusing to conclude your testimony when your time is up, or interrupting others' testimony or council deliberations will not be allowed. If you cause a disruption, a warning will be given. Further disruption will result in ejection from the meeting. Anyone who fails to leave once ejected is subject to arrest for trespass. Additionally, council may take a short recess and reconvene virtually. Your testimony today should address the, the matter being considered. When testifying, state your name for the record. Your address is not necessary. Disclose if you are a lobbyist. If you are representing an organization, please identify it. For testifiers joining virtually, please unmute yourself once the council calls your name. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we have one item today, item 799. Accept final report of the Police Accountability Commission. Thank you, and just uh, I'll say this right up front to give everybody plenty of fair warning. Rebecca, how many folks do we currently have signed up? Uh, 46 for public testimony. Okay, so so we have you know close to 50 people signed up for public testimony. We wanna make sure we hear from everybody, so plan on two minutes so that we can get through everybody who wants to be heard today. So just start thinking about your, your talking points with a two minute constraint. Colleagues, as you know, in 2020, voters passed an amendment to the city's charter to set in motion the development of a revised system of police accountability. The Police Accountability Commission, comprised of all volunteers, was created to develop a proposal for that revised system. These volunteers have worked incredibly hard over the better part of two years on this proposal, and I'm pleased to learn more about their recommendations for council's consideration today. Before we begin the presentation, I do need to make a couple of brief motions to amend this item with regard to two attachments. <coughs> These are basically technical amendments. Uh, the, uh, this item uh, is, the first is the PACS related to the PACS final report. The second is to its proposed code language. As I understand it, the original report included a draft of the final report rather than the actual final version of the report. As such, I move to amend item 799 to replace the Police Accountability Commission final report. Can I get a second? Second. We have a second from Commissioner Maps. Thank you. Uh, in addition, the original report as submitted did not include the Police Accountability Commissioner final city code recommendations. Therefore, I move to amend item 799 to include the Police Accountability Commission final city code recommendations. Can I get a second? Second. Thank you. And we'll vote on those at the end of public testimony, but I believe those both to be very friendly technical amendments. Turning now to the report itself, I'm pleased to introduce our presenters, Mike Myers, Elizabeth Perez, and Samir Kanal, all from the Community Safety Division. Welcome, and Mike, why don't you start, and if there's other people you need to introduce, if you could do that, I'd appreciate it. I'll do, I'll do that, Mayor. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Good afternoon, yeah, I'm, uh, And Mayor. I'm sorry, I see Elizabeth is not here. Could you state your name for the record? Yes, my name is Jamie Ridgway. Jamie, thank you. I appreciate it. Mike, go ahead. Okay. That, thank you, and good afternoon, Mayor, Council. For the record, my name is Mike Myers. I am the Community Safety Transition Director for the City of Portland. As you know, I served as your fire chief and then your emergency management director prior to being assigned to my current role on April 1st of 2021. By June of 2021, looking to find a home for the police accountability, accountability work, which originated from the charter amendment in November of 2020, it was decided the, decided the best home would be within the community safety division. Early steps involved the city council appointing a new 20 member police accountability commission to develop the proposals proposals I am proud to state that you will hear in this presentation today, 
some two years and three months after the original assignment was made. The Community Safety Division was made of one person in June of 2021. That was myself. My very first hire was the project manager for this very important commission. While the Council was working hard to of appointing volunteers to the commission in late July of 2021, I was working to hire a project manager. I looked far and wide, held several demanding interviews, and was very excited to choose Samir Kanal, who will be giving most of today's presentation as the lead project manager. Samir started in September of 2021 after the members were appointed and took on the incredible challenging role of working in this new space. It was a large workload around very complex <coughs> issue and on an extremely tight timeline. There were times, admittedly, when I thought, how is the commission ever going to get this work done on time? But they have, and they have done so with grace, diligence, and with the civil commitment our city government so very much depends on. I want to congratulate the whole staff, a tremendous team of diverse individuals for the work they put in to this project to this point. Samir Kanal, Austin Foster, Jamie Ridgway, Emily Mand, and Julian Massenberg. I also want to congratulate and thank the numerous volunteers for their tireless commitment to the City of Portland. I've been consistently impressed with the dedication and hard work of the volunteers on this commission. They have put in countless hours on evenings and weekends to meet the de its deadlines and to be in a position to present a proposal today for Council to consider. The team has hit milestone after milestone before finally sending their report to the City Council unanimously. Again, thank you so much for their efforts. Mayor, Council, accountability and public safety is, virtual, is, is vital to ensuring the trust of community members in the City. I think it's great that the Community Safety Division has been able to support such important work and be a small part of implementing the voters' approved charter text. We look forward to seeing how Council proceeds with the PAC's recommendations and are av available to offer continued support to this process. Thank you. And with that, I'd like to pass it over to the Reverend Dr. Leroy Haynes, Chair of the Albina Ministerial Alliance Coalition for Justice and Police Reform. I believe Dr. Haynes is virtual today. Uh, doctor? If you are here. You might need to be promoted. Yeah. Thank you so very much uh, uh, for this opportunity to once again uh, uh, share. I am the Reverend uh, Dr. Leroy Haynes Jr the president of the Abana Ministerial Alliance, the oldest ministerial alliance in the city of Portland for 75 years of service to this city, and also the chairman of the AMA Coalition for Justice and Police Reform. I want to first uh, say to our eminent mayor, Ted Willow, and to this distinguished members of the Portland City Council and members of the Police Accountability Commission, as well as the various staffs. I want to commend the uh, great work that has been done by this oversight uh, commission and their hard work, their research, their commitment, and their dedication. And the present uh, city uh, charter initiative for an independent citizen police oversight board emerged out of a mass civil rights nonviolent movement for justice and police reform in 2003 with the killing of an unarmed black woman by the name of Kendra James by a Portland police officer. It was out of this outrage of citizens in Portland, including Blacks, white, Latinos, various faith traditions, uh, different genders, uh, a variety of political perspectives covering all parts and neighborhoods of the citizens of Portland. This movement led to the creation of the Abana Ministerial Alliance Coalition for Justice and Police Reform that include all sections of the city of Portland 
races, faith traditions, and genders. Major organizations like the NAACP, the Urban League, uh, the uh, League of Women Voters, the ACLU, Latino Network, Job for Justice, uh, Mental Health Association, uh, EMO and bishops of various denominations, uh, basic rights and cop watch and other grassroots organization. This movement grew in the city of Portland as each unarmed shooting uh, by a Portland police officer happened. And it includes such death as Jahar Perez, Aaron Campbell, uh, James Chassie, Mijai Poot, and many others. The AMA Coalition for Justice and Police Reform, second goal was to create an independent citizen police oversight board with the power to compel testimony. Hence the vision of an independent police oversight board came well before the death of George Floyd, the mass marches that follow. Another goal of the AMA Coalition for Justice and Police Reform was to call for an audit of the Portland Police Bureau that subsequently led to the AMAC um, following a suit with others in the federal court with the Department of Justice. And this led to uh, AMAC receiving the enhanced amicus courier status and the present settlement agreement. This indigenous movement of all races, classes, genders, and young and old, all sections of the city of Portland, eventually led to the Charter Ballot Measure 26-217, where 82% of the voters in the city of Portland passed the measure for a new uh, independent uh, police oversight board. One of the largest percentage of voting ballot measures in the city of Portland. Today, we stand at a crossroad and pressing forward in addressing the crucial issues of police and community relations, in particularly in the Black community and other communities of color and citizens at large. The passage of this final report of the Police Oversight Board by the city commissioner is equivalent to the John Lewis police legislation that is stuck in Congress on the federal level. This charter proposal is the product of more than two decades, not only including AMAC, but also people like Ron Perrin and the uh, um, uh, Black Coalition and even the first commissioner, Charles Jordan, who initiated reform uh, um, efforts as the first black commissioner on the city council here in Portland. Uh, these commitment and dedication of black, brown, and white citizens of Portland to reform the Portland Police Bureau and create a true community uh, policing program that will create a new partnership between the police and community that have been victims both of police violence and criminal violence. A partnership that will be based on fair, just, and equal treatment and application of the constitution and laws of the city and state. A partnership that will help break down the barriers and polarization and create reconciliation in our city. A partnership that will enhance public safety and fight crime together and help build what Dr. Martin Luther King envisioned as the beloved community. A partnership that will birth a new beginning of raising our beloved city from the dark days of the past to the bright future of tomorrow. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Amen.
Thank you, Reverend Haynes. It's a privilege to have you with us and a very hard act to follow. Um, my name is Samir Kanal. for the record. I am the Advisory Boards and Commissions Manager for the Community Safety Division and was the Project Manager for the Police Accountability Commission. Just gonna get the slides pulled up here. Today's presentation, sorry. Uh, today's presentation has, um, focuses on the final report of the Police Accountability Commission. And it has, uh, for those following along, those documents are posted online. Um, for the members of the public, you can find those at tinyurl.com slash Portland PAC recommendations and include the commission's final proposals for city code as well as their final report. Although much of this presentation is being given by the staff, these are the proposals of the Police Accountability Commission, a group of 20 community volunteers appointed by city council to do this work. These proposals are theirs and they approved them unanimously on August 31st. During this presentation, speakers will explain the process that the PAC used to develop its recommendations and the system that they are recommend recommending. Presenters will walk through what the system will do, how it will be set up, and how it will be implemented in a way that is legitimate, fair, and effective. Um, as noted, this work is grounded in Charter Section 210, approved by voters in 2020. The PAC worked from their first meeting in December 2021 to their last meeting on August 31st, 2023, to develop their recommendations. These three slides are a high level overview of the proposal. More explanation on all of this is coming up later in the presentation with, with detail um, and there's much more detail in the body of the report. The Police Accountability Commission was tasked with creating a code change package outlining a new police oversight mission system. Their internal goals included developing a system that will be equitable, representative of the public, fair and impartial, and one that will earn the community's trust over time. In the Police Accountability Commission's proposal, the Oversight Board, named the Community Board for Police Accountability, will oversee the Office of Community-Based Police Accountability. That office will be led by a director who will hire and manage the staff needed to do the work of the oversight system. The new system will have several powers, including staff that conduct the investigations of potential misconduct affecting community members, panels of the board independently determining findings and if needed corrective action within approved discipline guides. The new system can issue policy recommendations to the police chief and if needed city council. The system balances transparency in reporting and access generally with the confidentiality required under law, including for personal identifying information and has meetings open to the public as well as hearings on specific cases of potential misconduct. And those are open to the public when in compliance with state law. And to talk about the process, I'll pass it over to Jamie Ridgway. Hi, uh, again, my name is Jamie Ridgway. I'm the Research and Policy Coordinator for the Police Accountability Commission. So before getting into what the commission's recommendations are, we wanted to touch on the process they used to reach their conclusions. The Police Accountability Commission was tasked with developing a framework for police oversight that fits within the parameters of charter and other legal requirements. The PAC also had to answer questions raised in the charter text and its code proposals. For example, those things that the charter said will be defined in code. These tasks were given to the Police Accountability Commission by City Council Resolutions 37527 and 37548. The Police Accountability Commission was asked to outline the organizational details and powers of the new system, as well as to develop a transition plan to seamlessly implement that new system. For members of the public to understand, the charter was approved by voters and is like the constitution of the city. The code that the Police Accountability Commission is recommending is like the law of the city, fitting within that charter framework. The commission did not discuss potential changes to charter text because that was outside of its scope of work. The charter is a mandate that the Police Accountability Commission was tasked to work within. This presentation has specific charter sections highlighted for each content section as it comes up. The Police Accountability Commission held 128 public meetings and hearings and 23 community engagement events. And between public comment, written submissions and events, they heard from over 1,500 Portlanders. The Police Accountability Commission heard from law enforcement, community organizations, city commissioners, business groups, representatives from the current system, and other officials. A full list of these meetings, events, and briefers can be found in the report. 
The Police Accountability Commission was mandated to identify current barriers that have stymied the work of Portland police oversight systems. And to go into those barriers, I will pass it on to Commissioner Sophia. Mm -hmm. um, for the record, my name is Sophia Glenn. I was a member of the commission and I co-chaired the first phase of the work for the full commission and the subcommittee on research and in the second phase. I was appointed to the PAC as a representative of community justice organizations. Between April um, and October 2022, we worked to identify these barriers. So afterwards, we, um, we could start to what we call make suggestions on how to overcome these barriers. Because we aim to solve these problems in our overall work, this document is the problem statement of the Commission's work. We also identify best practices to maintain or replicate. The PAC found that uh, civilian um, parts of the current system, the Independent Pol Police Review and the Citizens Review Committee, were transparent and had strong reporting, as well as, uh, as, well as language uh, accessibility. The investigators in all parts of the current system are highly qualified uh, civilians. Uh, and pursue investigations and reviews in with rigor. The PAC identified the option of mediation as a way to quickly resolve some cases and allowing closure for both the officers and the community. And finally, a connection between these processes and policy evaluation and the options of findings uh, beyond discipline or corrective action have been positive, um, though used inconsistently. The PAC also conducted a thorough research into the oversight systems around um, county, um, country, and um, sorry, around the, the country, and recommended uh, structures from experts, which informed the PAC on the practices as they wish to avoid and those they wish to include in the building upon in the recommendations to city council. Thank you. Um, the Police Accountability Commission was required to define independent judgment, which is a term that exists in the charter during their work, and they agreed on this definition, quote, a demonstrable absence of real or perceived influence from law enforcement, political actors, and other special interests looking to affect the operations of the civilian oversight agency. Although the board will have that independent judgment, it is subject to all the normal city rules and procedures, including the laws, uh, collective bargaining obligations, and administrative rules that apply to every part of the city. Um, next is discussing what the proposed new system will do and the authorities that it will have to carry out its duties. <clears throat> Access to information refers to the ability of the oversight system to obtain the information that it needs to do the work of handling specific cases of potential misconduct and conducting overall review that might lead to policy recommendations. Most of the framework on this topic was outlined in the charter, including compelling testimony, subpoenaing and compelling documents, and accessing police records. The PAC's proposal also includes a requirement for the board to work collaboratively with the Portland Police Bureau, including through requesting interviews prior to the use of any of these specific empowerments under the charter. Much of this structure is also already in city code for the current system, such as the independent police review's ability to subpoena documents and access records. The commission's recommendations are generally to retain existing code on access to information with some slight adjustments. Administrative investigators will also have access to body-worn camera footage, which is in compliance with the agreement between City Council and the Portland Police Association approved in April of 2023. The Commission also added a section in on da data protection, confidentiality, and stewardship. If the Oversight Board accesses police data, they need to uphold Portland Police Bureau's information security standards. Similarly, medical data will only be requested where strictly relevant. This all ensures that the Oversight Board is able to make fully informed decisions. Thank you. Next up is the investigation process. 
for members of the public listening, the PAC's proposed system does not relate in any way to either civil lawsuits related to policing or to potential criminal charges. The Oversight Board's authority relates to employment-focused investigations and corrective action. So this section is called administrative investigations. Um, the other definition that I'll be mentioned today is, uh, there were many that were required to the PAC, but the other one is accountability. The commission's working definition of accountability is on the slide here and it reads, accountability is a comprehensive system of checks and balances aimed at ensuring that when law enforcement fails to carry out their duties properly, including when their actions are damaging to other individuals or the community at large, they are held responsible through a fair and transparent process. The first thing mentioned in the charter uh, as a mission for the oversight board is to independently investigate promptly, fairly, and impartially, and to uh, determine the appropriate discipline to impose. The charter specifies a minimum list of things to investigate, and the PAC was tasked with determining what else should be investigated by the board. When there are findings of misconduct, the charter provides the oversight board with authority to determine discipline within the city's discipline guide. The council tasked the PAC with developing a workflow of investigations and processes associated with cases of potential misconduct. The PAC proposal includes a single structure of five steps which will be followed for all cases that are within the oversight board's jurisdiction. And this slide is a sh uh, shortened version of it, the cylindrical paper in front of you and uh, on the briefing book, as well as on, I think, page 148 of the uh, report has the, uh, the full flow chart with all the details. Um, the PAC's uh, proposal says that cases involving alleged misconduct affecting a community member would go to the oversight board and the new system on these slides, whereas internal or human resources type complaints would not go to the oversight board and would be handled through the police's internal processes. Uh, um, it's actually page 414 of the uh, report, sorry. Um, the five steps are intake, investigation, findings, corrective action, and discipline, and appeals. The system also allows for additional options of mediation or informal complaints for less severe allegations. And there's some slides explaining each of these in a little more detail. Um, the commission's proposal includes automatic intake for those things that are specified in the charter. Uh, that includes things like uh, uses of deadly force, violations of constitutional rights, things like that. Um, additionally, any person who experiences or witnesses alleged misconduct uh, can file a complaint. At intake, the complainant will be assigned a complaint navigator, which uh, I think the mayor described as a customer service type position, which will keep them informed throughout the process and be a point of contact. The complaint will also be categorized as would this be an allegation of discourtesy, dishonesty, neglect of duty, for example. And also the system will assign cases to full investigations, dismiss cases as needed, and determine whether the case is eligible for mediation or an informal complaint. The second step is investigation, which are conducted by the staff and will be uh, required to be ethical, independent, thorough, timely, uh, fair, and impartial. This includes interviews, collecting evidence, and could also include those empowerments mentioned in the access to information section. Um, investigation updates are shared regularly with officers and complainants so they know the progress through the system. And once the investigation is complete and reviewed, considered to be complete enough to proceed, the process moves to the third step, which is findings. The completed investigations will be presented to a panel, which is a small group of board members, five members in most cases, with the ability to be slightly larger in high profile or complex cases at a hearing. And the panel will come to a decision on implying a finding using the preponderance of the evidence standard. There are four options for findings and the, the panel must choose one for each case. Um, they could be in policy, the officer acted within the policy of the Portland Police Bureau, out of policy, the officer violated police policy, unfounded, which is that evidence shows that the alleged events did not occur, or insufficient evidence, which is not enough information to attach any of the other three. Um, the board also has options for findings that aren't just about what the officer did, but about how the system can improve. Um, there are five additional findings that the panel can choose to apply, any, all, or none of these. And when the board applies these findings, they'll notify the police bureau so that the problem can be addressed and can also make recommendations about how to improve. If there is a finding of out of policy, that means misconduct occurred, and the panel would here indicate what discipline options are likely to be considered 
in the next step, which is discipline and corrective action. Um, the fourth step uh, is that the, the board has the authority to issue disciplinary action up to and including termination, consistent with discipline guides, but also consistent with due process and just cause considerations um, to ensure that officers' rights are upheld. Not all of the responses are discipline. Uh, some are more training or command counseling to help promote better performance from the individual in the future. This is something that the PAC added in based on both public feedback and feedback from Commissioner Maps in the briefing. Um, and the last step is appeals. Uh, uh, both complainants and officers have the right to appeal to the board, which is also in the current system. Officers also have two additional options that only officers have to appeal, including the city's civil service board of filing a grievance, which can lead to arbitration, and all that's maintained from the current system. And finally, there are processes designed for lower level cases to take the burden off of the investigative system when a full investigation is not required and to help achieve closure faster for officers and community members alike. If a complainant would prefer resolving an issue informally with the officer involved through mediation, they can, or they can pursue discussing the matter with the officer's supervisor. And if those processes are successful, that resolves the complaint. If any party thinks it was unsuccessful, the complaint goes to a full investigation. I'll now pass it over to Commission Member Dan Handelman, who is on Zoom. Good afternoon, Commissioners, Mayor Wheeler. Uh, for the record, my name is Dan Handelman. I was a member of the Commission. I co-chaired the subcommittee on officer accountability. I was appointed to the uh, Commission as a representative of a community justice organization. Uh, this process creates a level playing field in several ways. Both officers and complainants are allowed up to three support persons with them throughout the process including at hearing. Investigations by the oversight system and decisions by community members serving on the board, not police, will increase fairness for all, including for officers. Additionally, there are equal uh, updates throughout the process for officers and complainants of the process, uh, of the, the progress of their cases. There are four key differences between the complaint process and the current system and the new process being proposed. Uh, there will be a complaint navigator provided to the complainant from the initiation of the complaint. This person will be available to act as a single point of contact for the complainant. One entity reviews each case, the new oversight board. Complaints will no longer bounce among different systems, allowing the process to be more straightforward and less complex than the current process. The board will investigate uses of deadly force, and there will be an ability to appeal these cases. Community members make the decisions regarding findings and disciplinary or corrective action subject to the corrective action guide. Uh, while the Commission agreed that there are aspects of the current oversight system that needs to be streamlined and simplified, uh, members also identified some practices that will remain the same. There are three key similarities between the current system and the system being proposed. The use of the City and the Portland Police Association bargained and state discipline guides when determining appropriate disciplinary action or corrective action. The use of panels of five board members to determine findings with larger panels allowed for more complex cases, which is similar to what the Police Review Board currently does, and there will be no change to officers' due process, just cause, or Fifth Amendment rights. Thank you. That was the uh, the longest section of the, the presentation here um, on the, the system. Uh, next up is discussing how the board will present policy recommendations to the Portland Police Bureau and City Council. Um, the charter specifies that the mission includes making recommendations regarding police practices, policies, and directives. Uh, structural oversight refers to the actions of the oversight board that are about the larger system, including fair standards that police officers can follow. Um, Mayor Wheeler, during his briefing with the PAC, talked about ensuring a high standard of conduct for officers, and the PAC referenced that when proposing a structure that allows for a community-led process to establish those standards through recommending policies and directives that officers would be held accountable to. The PAC's policy recommendation process includes multiple methods for initiating recommendations, including input from community members, policy review from individual cases or high profile incidents, and also taking part in the Portland Police's directive review process, which is a very comprehensive process for evaluating their own process, uh, directives. Um, the structure ensures that the staff reviews patterns of previous cases large-scale events and individual misconduct. And the PAC also looked at other models around the country, including peer cities such as Seattle, to develop recommendations related to community voice and collective bargaining and gathering public input for the Portland Police Bureau to help them as they develop their annual budget. 
Finally, the PAC also proposed ways to hold the accountability system itself accountable. This included a requirement for assessment, including by outside researchers, and an internal process with an internal inspector general or monitor. And next up in the presentation is the structure that ensures the system can uh, perform all the duties discussed in the previous section. Um, the charter provides clear parameters for board membership and also provides questions that the, uh, sorry, that the uh, council asked the PAC to answer. Um, first, it's important to note that under the charter, uh, council approves all board members, appoints them. Um, the board must include those from diverse communities with diverse lived experiences, particularly those who've experienced systemic racism and those who've experienced mental illness, addiction, or alcoholism. Um, the charter also mandates the removal of barriers and prohibits current and former law enforcement employees as well as the immediate family of current employees from serving as members of the board, although they can still be a part of various other board processes. Council asked the commission to determine the size of the oversight board, selection method, um, term length, quorum, method to ensure representation, and compensation levels. Okay. Um, yeah. So uh, the PAC proposed an all-volunteer community police oversight board in, a, in order to avoid creating a system where service on the board could be someone's primary source of income. To achieve that volunteer board and meet the diversity and representation goals, as well as ensuring low turnover and institutional cohesion, the PAC proposed a 33-member oversight board, as well as at least five alternates. Now, most of the work will be done in small groups, not the full board, and the next slide explains that. Being able to work in small groups allows for the removal of barriers to service for members that have other time commitments, and will also allow for valuable diverse experiences to be represented. The PAC proposed three-year staggered renewable terms, citizen the similar to the Citizen Review Committee structure. Uh, staggering terms creates institutional memory, and the PAC also proposed a peer training system in addition to staff-facilitated training for new members. Members will need to live, work, play, attend school or worship in Portland, as with any other city volunteer commitment. And the PAC also added to um, the uh, representation goals in terms of age, race and ethnicity, gender, housing status, geography, neighborhoods, and more. Pass it over to Jamie for the next slide here. Um, I think that Commissioner Sophia. Oh, sorry. As previously mentioned, uh, many matters will be handled by a subset of the board uh, rather than by the entire board. Uh, the council asked the PAC to determine if the full board or subset would hear individual cases um, aligning, uh, alleging misconduct. The PAC proposed subsets called panels, generally with five members uh, who would decide uh, individual cases, and the membership of the panels would rotate between the board members. The board may form a subcommittee which can develop proposals for full board consideration. As a result, the 33 members are uh, really a pool of community members from which the subcommittees and panels can be formed. It's not going to be 33 people hearing a case involving potential officer misconduct. In the current structure, there are already 26 seats for this type of work, and in the city, in, in this city, and, uh, and so 33 is a, a small uh, increase. In developing the size and the composition of the board, the PAC looked at its own experiences and experiences from other groups and the city, including the Citizens Review Committee. Members have experiences within the context of their volunteer service, including internal cohesion issues, sometimes related to leader or membership changes. With high levels of workload and low levels of institutional support, lack of clarity and staff support, the emotional and, and, and mental health burden of the work itself. The PAC noted that volunteers often have other things going on in their lives which make volunteering service more difficult. And increased chances of volunteer burnout and turnover. 
This can be avoided or mitigated by rotating the workload and having enough colleagues to collaborate with. The PAC itself had developed changes, uh, had uh, employment changes, family losses, gr uh, caregiving issues, responsibilities, and newborn babies. Um, building a larger board with a modest number uh, uh, compensation, a modest member compensation, sorry, will keep the membership full, representative, and equitable, and reduce turnover by ensuring that the volunteer members are supported. The Police Accountability Commission wrote the Oversight Board will be a unique type of volunteer service, different from most volunteer boards and committees and commissions. Uh, the board shall create systems supporting and protecting individual members. This includes a, co uh, a, a compensation structure for the board members that recognizes their volunteer status while maximizing the accessibility of service, service on the board and promoting equity. It also includes being supportive of members, mental health uh, due to the potentially traumatic nature of the work. The uh, PAC proposed that members of the oversight board be eligible for modest compensation. Um, it's important to note this compensation proposal mm -hmm. is not a proposal in the city code. Instead, the PAC included in its report that it recommends to the future board and its staff that they establish the levels of compensation in their administrative rules. The PAC's proposed compensation structure is indexed to the number of hours put in by individual volunteers. The estimated midpoint is $5,400 per year, not enough to act as a primary source of income, but it may alleviate the costs associated with volunteering. Um, this will total less than 1.5% of the overall oversight budget, and several other jurisdictions in America provide compensation, including several uh, at $5,000 or more dollars per year, and there's a full list of, that, uh, of those jurisdictions in the report as well. So that was the volunteer section, and now we'll move on to the staff. The charter authorizes a director with all other staff reporting to them. That staff is required to include administrative staff as well as investigators. The director makes operational and administrative decisions and reports to the board who hires and manages the director. The full board will vote to hire a director from a pool of applicants narrowed down by a small review group of the board. There is a potential criteria the board can use in evaluating the director. The director qualifications are modeled off the qualifications for the independent police review director currently in city code. Effectively, that they need to understand how investigations work and need to have the ability to manage other staff. And now I will pass it on to Commissioner Ajay. Hello, for the record, my name is Ajay Mechi, also known as Jay. I was a member of the commission. I co-chaired the full commission during the powers and duties phase of work and also co-chaired the oversight staff subcommittee. I was appointed to the PAC as representative of organizations serving over police communities. Like IPR and as the charter says, the director is a bureau director. The new oversight board will be a bureau within the city. The Oversight Board will have a defined budget and go through the budget process each year, but with a charter mandated floor proportional to 5% of the PPB budget. And it will have an independent office to ensure both officers and community members are comfortable in the Oversight Board space. Being part of the city structure, it will report to a city administrator or deputy city administrator. Staff will have responsibilities, including policy, mediation, investigation, support for members, community engagement, auditing, data analysis, equity and inclusion, and administration. The Oversight Board is in charge of facilitating a participatory public process for police oversight. The process will be community-driven and employ qualified staff to help community members on the board do their jobs. Reporting and transparency includes a list of questions asked of the commission by city council, including transparency of the process, what is open to the public, when information is shared with council, and what data is available publicly. The charter requires that 
the board shall make provisions for regular and open meetings, public transparency, and reporting on the board's activities. And now I will pass it on to Commissioner Debbie on Zoom. Hi, I'm Debbie Iona. I was a member of the commission, co-chair during the transition plan and broader system phase, and also subcommittee co-chair on structural oversight and for reporting and transparency. I was appointed to the commission as a representative of a community justice organization. First, the commission separated between meetings and hearings. Meetings will include community-focused town halls, briefings, and more. The PAC envisions that the board will meet with its staff director regularly and also host the mayor, chief of police, and other public safety officials regularly. These meetings will be open to the public and open to public comment. Hearings are where panels receive and evaluate information on whether or not officers committed misconduct, address corrective action decisions, and consider appeals. They would be closed to the public except in two specific situations. One situation would be if the officer requests an open hearing. The other would be if the board determines the case is of a high profile and a high enough profile that the public interest requires it. Both of these are defined under state law. The Police Accountability Commission proposes a comprehensive annual report with some required contents presented to city council. The proposal includes that the board can also do smaller regular, regular reports, such as quarterly reports. Finally, it will have, a complaint, have complaint data presented in a variety of ways. This includes information about investigations, findings, discipline imposed, and timeliness to the extent allowable by law. The Oversight Board will publish raw data for download and for display on dashboards with personal identifiable information redacted. The Commission envisions a system where confidentiality is respected while promoting transparency. Transparency includes accessibility, culturally specific and translated materials, as well as meetings to walk through the reports for community members with an interest in learning more. Thank you. Thanks, Debbie. Thank you. The new system also exists within a broader system of government and needs to communicate with other levels of government, but as previously noted, it is a independent, uh, a city bureau with independent judgment and therefore will work within city structures. The new oversight system may need to work with external law enforcement entities, including district attorneys, to get information related to specific cases or to transmit information regarding policies. The PAC agreed that their proposed system should, quote, strive to maintain working relationships uh, that are cordial and not adversarial, including with law enforcement. And here I'll pass it over to Commission Member Cameron. For the record, my name is Cameron Brown. I was a member of the commission as a representative of small businesses. Uh, finally, the, PA, the PAC believes that Portland and this oversight board should be a model for other jurisdictions. Uh, the Police Accountability Commission learned from other cities and counties' experiences and anticipates that our own work will be referenced in other cities as well when they next revisit their own systems. As a result, while most of the Police Accountability Commission's recommendations maintain or adjust existing code or source ideas from other jurisdictions. There are ways in which the Police Accountability, Accountability Commission proposals are designed to help make Portland a leader in police accountability. Thank you. Thank you. So all of that, uh, those sections explain how the system will work when it is fully implemented. This uh, next part discusses how the PAC proposed initially setting up the oversight system. The settlement agreement between the U.S. and the, uh, the U.S. Department of Justice and the city outlines many of the next steps in this process. It requires the city to send uh, proposed code changes within 60 days of receiving the PAC's proposal to the U.S. Court and Department of Justice. Alongside these proposed changes, the city has to send proposed amendments to the settlement agreement that would allow for oversight board implementation. 
After the DOJ and court review, the city council has 21 days under the settlement agreement to formally adopt the city code, and that begins a one-year transition period at the end of which the new board has to be able to begin accepting complaints. The PAC was required by the city council to create a transition plan, and that needed to include maintaining operations of independent police review and the citizen review committee until the new system is fully implemented, a plan for how to get initial members appointed and staff hired, and answering specific questions such as about whether or not IPR staff would have preference to apply for staff positions within the new system. Here I'll pass it over to commission members Catherine and Faith. For the record, my name is Faith Aiken. I was a member of the commission uh, and co-chaired subcommittees on the community engagement framework, structural oversight, and on the transition plan. I was a full co-chair of the commission during the fact-finding phase of work. I was appointed by council as a representative of a community justice organization. The PAC has three main proposals in this section that would require council action. The first two relate to transferring cases to the new system from the old. If any cases can't be resolved within six months, the PAC proposes that they be moved from the old system to the new one. This will minimize the length of time the two systems overlap and give clarity to the city, community, and both officers and complainants. Finally, during the one-year period that the new system ramps up after the code is approved, but before it's required to be able to take in complaints, four tasks have to happen in order. The city has to get applications for and appoint board members. The board members need to get applications for interview and hire a director. The director needs to hire staff, in particular, particular intake and investigative staff. Finally, those staff need to be trained so they can begin taking in complaints at the end of the year. That's a heavy lift within one year's time. As a result, the PAC asked for a transition team to be designated within the city to begin work during the DOJ court review of this proposal on community outreach and education so that, the when, so that when the code is approved, the new system can hit the ground running and ensure the city remains in compliance. For the record, my name is Catherine McDowell. I use she, her pronouns. I was the co-chair of the fourth phase of um, work, the structure and details phase, and co-chair of the transition plan subcommittee along with Commissioner Aiken. At this point, we'd like to share our views on the legitimacy of the new system, which is something we know matters a great deal to the council and also to members of this commission. It is vital that this system be one that is able to earn the trust of all involved, including city stakeholders, law enforcement stakeholders, and community stakeholders. This is a key component of the Police Accountability Commission's approach. The Police Accountability Commission supports the Charter Section 210 framework and built our proposals within this framework to promote the values of legitimacy, fairness, and effectiveness. The Commission was not tasked with evaluating the framework of the Charter that established it or proposing the changes, proposing changes to the Charter. Our role was to uphold the voter-approved text as you asked us to do, and that was what we did. In terms of the Police Accountability Commission's process, we approached it impartially. The Commission was not required to identify best practices. The charge was to identify barriers. However, the Commission did identify good practices in the current system so that they could be maintained or replicated and built upon. Examples of this include the retention of the mediation program and the appeals process advisor used at the Citizen Review Committee being expanded into our complaint navigator proposal. The Commission also sought out input from law enforcement, including the police, um, uh, Portland Police Association and Portland Police Bureau leadership, and we incorporated it. For example, police experts proposed including that some investigators in the new oversight system be certified as civilian homicide investigators for use of deadly force investigations, and the Commission included that proposal. 
Other recommendations include that law enforcement experts could be involved as consultants in training the new board members, as well as any contracted work, such as evaluating investigations, and that Portland Police Bureau's training division be consulted by hearings panels. The Police Accountability Commission approached the process from the perspective that the charter requires that law enforcement not be decision makers here, but that the system will be most effective and legitimate if there is a relationship that is independent but non-adversarial between law enforcement and the oversight system. Thank you, Catherine. My name is Charlie Michelle Wesley. Um, I was chosen uh, for my community justice organization, uh, my excessive lived experience in over-policed communities. Uh, I was the uh, subcommittee co-chair on the um, officer accountability and a few other subcommittees I have lost track of, but I was the uh, overall co-chair uh, of the full commission for phase four and phase six. We believe that the recommendations we've outlined in this report will transform police accountability in Portland and provide a fair and equitable system for both community members and police officers. In, in preparing these, we continue to center our core values and goals, equity and inclusion, anti-racism, harm reduction, transparency, trustworthiness, community-centered, and effectiveness. While we have attempted to reflect community, sorry, this is uh, page two, to reflect community input and views to the degree allowable by law, we expect that our recommendations may not go far enough for some and may be perceived as large change by others. We also know that the Police Accountability Commission's recommendations cannot solve every problem. This is just one aspect related to transforming the culture of policing. It is difficult to create accountability within a system that is rooted in historic races, just injustice, and current legal constraints. The paradox of working within a flawed system to develop a functional alternative is one that the Police Accountability Commission consistently struggled with. However, we also know that it, is, was, it was council's commitment to the city's core values of equity and anti-racism that influ influenced both the decision to send Measure 26217 to the ballot and council's continued support of the Police Accountability Commission's work. By approving this plan, not only will you uphold these same core values, but you have an opportunity to contribute to much needed healing in the community. Thank you. Thank you. As today is the uh, presentation of the final report of the PAC, uh, and to avoid reading all 500 plus pages of the report live, uh, the presentation opened with part of the intro and it'll conclude with the last couple of sentences from the PAC's report. Um, before I pass it to Commissioner, you may for that a quick logistical note that after Q&A, there are a couple final invited comments from um, a couple of the members of the commission. So, um, and you may have questions after that too. It's just a few minutes there. Um, so I'll pass it over to Commissioner Yume to close it. Thank you, Samir. For the record, my name is Yume Delegado. I was a member of the commission and council appointed me this past June as a member of the an over police community. I am also bringing my experience uh, as a member of the current system of work as vice chair of the citizen review committee, which is part of the current system. The police accountability commission's final report ends with these thoughts. Our proposals, if implemented, are part of meeting the community need for police accountability. We look forward to continuing to collaborate as community members with City Council to ensure that our proposals are evaluated, discussed, and able to be implemented in a way that meets the needs of community and fulfills the mandate given to the city by the voters it serves. Thank you for the opportunity to work together towards a more accountable police oversight system. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your time, and we'll turn it over to questions at this point. All right, very good. Our colleagues, questions at this time, or do we want to hear public testimony and then get to questions? 
Why don't we do that? Because um, I, I have a number of questions I'd like to ask, but I think uh, I know there's people who have childcare and picking kids up at school and everything else. So why don't, why don't we get into public testimony, two minutes each, name for the record, and then we can, uh, we'll probably take a break at the end of public testimony so that our uh, TV folks have a chance to, to take a break. <laughs> Uh, and I'll probably need one too. Uh, so two minutes each, name for the record. Mr. Mayor, can I ask for a clarification? I, 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 so is there invited testimony? I, I wasn't quite. It, there, are, there are three members of the commission who um, w we wanted to give a couple minutes to speak in their personal capacities um, that aren't are, are on they, there. Are they part of the public testimony or are they separate? They're, they're not, they're invited speakers. They, you've heard from uh, a little. Thank you, I did not know that. So let's do yeah. the, you introduce, make them part of your presentation and when you're done with the presentation, turn it back to me and we'll go to public testimony. Thank you, thank, thank you, you Mayor Wheeler. Thank you for clarifying. Thanks. Thanks so Commissioner. we'll start with uh, Commissioner Charlie and then it goes to Commissioner Dan and finally Commissioner Yume. Um, those are the three. So I'll pass it to Commissioner Charlie. Hello again. <laughs> So once again, um, I'm Charlie Michelle Wesley, and um, I'm a tribal member of the Confederated Tribes of Grand Ron, and I'm a descendant of multiple tribes from the Northwest on this indigenous land um, that we refer to as Turtle Island that is now known as America. Um, and as an indigenous woman, I have, ha I have endured a lifetime of traumatic racism, systemic racism an extensive lived experience as a witness to a target of a victim of and a survivor of over-policing excessive force, including being shot at. I'm gonna share some hard truths for reflection because some years ago, I was granted custody of my black indigenous grandson. And despite it all, I was determined to do what I could to keep him safe. Uh, living in a, a, a neighborhood that we lived in that was over-policed. Um, but when he became a teen, I had to have the talk that we caretakers have to have with our BIPOC teens. The how to stay alive when pulled over by police talk. It's heartbreaking and no child should have to be subjected to that discussion, but it is absolutely necessary. When you are a person of color, you don't have to commit a crime to experience being targeted by police, excessive force. You don't have to resist or verbally object. You merely have to be black, brown, indigenous, and or live where you live, work where you work, or be in a neighborhood you are perceived as not belonging in, or driving, shopping, jogging, sleeping, knocking on the wrong door, in crisis or a black child playing with a toy gun to be a victim of deadly force. Their lives mattered, and so did the voices of survivors who bring an invaluable perspective that is lacking when creating systems that can help instead of harm. Our voices are a gift. The truth of it is that white supremacy determines who lives and dies during these calls. It is the foundation of all the institutions, yet we aren't supposed to talk about it or admit that barriers to accountability are rooted in it, but we have to adhere to its laws and policing, and we suffer from it. My hope is that this new police accountability system will ultimately be approved and used as your opportunity to build upon. So when my grandson has children, that maybe, just maybe, that how to stay alive conversation won't be necessary for our BIPOC children and that that protect and serve actually pertains to them as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Charlie. Next, uh, again, um, these three commission members speaking in their personal capacity. I'll pass it over to Commission Member Dan Handelman on Zoom. Uh, good afternoon again. I'm still Dan Handelman. Uh, today I'm speaking in my personal capacity as a former commissioner. I was elected by my peers to be one of the three co-chairs in the final phase of our work. 
I did a lot of research for this project, and I found that both here and in the city of Portland and in other jurisdictions, it was difficult to figure out how the police oversight systems really work. For example, as I was proofreading the annotated city code, there was no reference to how IPR staff currently can go to the scene of deadly force incidents. I set about to find out where that authority comes from. It was added in 2010 after the death of Aaron Campbell. I had Ms. Iona look for it too, as she studied the IPR since it was created. She was only able to find one reference in one IPR annual report. I eventually found the authorizing language in the Bureau Directive on Deadly Force Incidents. There are other items which I know are part of current practice, but it takes looking at protocols, city code, directives, contracts, and other documents to find them. Even asking people deeply engaged in the process, I could not find a reference to cover sheets which are attached to investigations where policy and other issues can be flagged by police supervisors in the same way the new board will make systemic findings. I understand there's concern that the proposed code by the commission includes items that might be better put into protocol. However, it will be up to the board and its director to establish those protocols some three and a half years after the vote to create the new board. The PAC designed a system to work as a whole, and having these guidelines and code will provide clarity and save time in setting up the new system. The system is designed to self-correct so council can make changes moving forward. IPR was supposed to be reviewed within one year of its creation, but the first review wasn't conducted until seven years into its existence. Either way, Council should modernize its code to include links, allowing the public to access detailed information for bodies like the IPR and the new board. The other main point I'd like to address is a dual question from folks about the size of the board and its budget. The current system handles about 400 cases a year, and the police review boards holds maybe 50 hearings a year with a rotating set of members. Other cases are decided by officer supervisors. The Citizen Review Committee's busiest recent year saw their 11-person body hold eight appeal hearings. We're predicting the new board will need to make decisions in as many as 280 cases, meaning with 33 people, they will have a workload of about 45 cases per person per year, nearly one per week on average. As for staff, the commission envisions that staff includes investigators, advocates, data analysts, community outreach persons, and support staff for the board's meetings and hearings. When I crunched numbers based on the salaries of IPR and internal affairs as guidance, the $12 million budget that's being criticized disappears very quickly. Some people think this board should not be a high priority. Many of those people have likely never been pushed up against a wall by a police force, exposed to chemical weaponry, been racially profiled, or lost a loved one to police bullets. I'm sad to say to fellow community members that even trying to level the playing field, the laws still favor the police. But at least this system will create a sense that the officers who violate policy will be held accountable and lead to a more just and equitable Portland. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Member Dan, and finally, Commissioner Yume. Thank you, Samir. Mayor Wheeler, esteemed commissioners, it's good to see you again. Uh, three months ago, you appointed me to the Police Accountability Commission at the start of their final phase of work. And it's been a great honor to serve in this capacity, but I'm going to be honest, it has been the longest summer of my life. Um, this has truly been a heavy lift. But the real credit goes to my fellow commissioners who have done this work tirelessly for nearly two years. It is with fortitude, grace, and compromise that they came together to accomplish this nearly impossible task, and they did so unanimously. So when I come to you today, I wish to speak to the issue of legitimacy and the issue of bias. I want to be clear, the proposal before you is not, as some would say, an extremist proposal. It has been responsive to feedback from stakeholders, all of whom have spoken about the need for a better system, including this council, the PPA, and members of the current system, such as myself. And we have tried to reconcile that input soberly and deliberately into a truly just system that is fair to both community and police. When people criticize these proposals, I find it disheartening that some seem to think that only an unaccountable system of policing can provide public safety. I reject that conclusion. For too long, we have stacked the deck against ourselves and then chafed against the outcomes. And I know that I've heard members of council express that, that view. This must stop. At some level, this proposal is also a referendum on the value of public service. This work is one of the biggest responsibilities that we entrust to non-elected officials. And I think we underestimate how much people rise to the occasion when asked. I think we underestimated how much the Police Accountability Commission would rise to the occasion when asked. Like you, as a member of the Citizen Review Committee, 
I swore to uphold the Constitution and the city charter. I'm sure you remember how you felt on the day that you swore that oath. I remember how I felt. And I felt that weight heavy on my shoulders for the past two and a half years. I cannot imagine that you or I would ever dream of exercising that responsibility in a biased or unfair manner. Likewise, I think it would be cynical and defeatist to assume that the people that you, you, this council, will choose to serve on this board will wield that authority any differently than you or I would. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Yume. And now I will turn it over to you, Mayor Wheeler. Thank you. All right, good, thank you. And uh, it's, it is good to hear uh, applause and support for things people are saying, but in order to keep public testimony going, uh, if people could not emote, and that also means no negative emoting, if you hear something you don't like, this is a democratic space, so you're likely to hear some things that, that uh, you don't support, and we just ask that everybody, when they get to the microphone, uh, have the opportunity to speak freely and see this as a safe place. Uh, two minutes each, please. Name for the record. About six-ish inches from the microphone works really well, and we'll just turn it over to the council clerk. Rebecca, go ahead. Start with Monica Arce and Tiana Tozer. And you guys don't have to sit there if, if you don't want. Clear some space, yeah. Uh, Rebecca, maybe we could call three at a time, and that way we can get people teed up and ready to go. After... Tiana, we have James Upsink. Welcome. Hi, thank you. Hey. My name is Monica Arce, and I served as commissioner representing organizations serving over police communities, as well as being a proud Latina and member of, the, of an over police community. I'm a Peruvian American immigrant, and I moved to Portland 29 years ago with a group of friends after college. I trained at OHSU and became a midwife and my friends became an extended family with at least 21 children attending schools in Portland. I work at a community health center serving migrant communities to welcome babies into the world that are served with my, with my bicultural and bilingual skills. I organized the Light for Liberty protest in Portland for migrant children put in cages and killed at the border. I marched for black and brown lives. I faced tear gas wearing an N95, my kid's bike helmet, and ski goggles while running away from people that were supposed to protect me. Portland voted for police accountability, and soon after I applied to be part of the commission. I didn't know that over the next two years I would be attending more than 130 meetings, each of over two plus hours, and get homework and research to do at home. I didn't give up midway because I love the city, and I love what we did. Portlanders voted for a ballot measure, and you gave us a job of turning it into city code a transition plan, and a detailed design faithful to the voters and to the city charter. I was one of the least qualified, and on police accountability matters, I served with people that have dedicated their life to this, who served selflessly and produced this package. I am confident that your police accountability commission did its job above and beyond any expectations. It is time for you, our city council, to do your part in this process and be part of this tide for hope for communities like mine. Do not let yourself be swayed by a small and vocal minority that doesn't trust community to oversee Portland police. The large majority of Portland votes when it needs to, but does not show to testify in front of you. I urge you to trust that Portland voted wisely and that you picked the right commission for this. Portland votes for parks and schools. We vote for Portland street response, and we voted for police accountability, fully funded and led by community because this is who we are, and this is beautiful. It is the glimmer of hope that my community really needs right now. Thank you. Thank you. Afternoon. Mayor, commissioners, I am Tiana Tozer. I'm here today as a private citizen, a victim of violent crime, and as a member of an over police minority as identified by the Police Accountability Commission. I'm here to testify against the Police Punishment Commission, which would be a better name for what the PAC final report outlines. Creating a biased accountability commission that has no oversight or accountability, particularly with a $13 million budget, is an interesting concept. What could possibly go wrong? 
On page 16 of the PAC final report, it states the PAC was also bound by federal and state law, including protections for officers that may be subjects of administrative investigations. These protections include due process. I'm not an attorney, but it is my understanding that impartiality is one of the main tenets of due process. On page 44, the report states the PAC made several key decisions in developing its areas of agreement on board membership, including the third bullet point. Selection criteria for the board, which include the charter requirements, as well as a preference for those affected by over-policing. I can't even begin to understand how that is impartial. On page 136, the board may investigate other complaints or incidents of misconduct as they see fit or mandated by city code. Translation, whatever they want. After reading this 365-page final report, my conclusion is that this is nothing more than a naked power grab, similar to what I saw in Iraq and Sudan, that will compromise the safety and the welfare of the people of Portland that this commission was appointed to serve. It is the next thinly veiled step in defunding the police. It is anti-democratic for a commission to not follow their guidelines and then venerate their work product as a sacred cow, and to tell you, our elected officials, that to change anything is to thwart the will of the voters. If implemented, we are looking at failure on the scale of Measure 110, but the bottom line is Portlanders are fed up and fleeing the city because of violence, drugs, and property damage. How will this help? I urge you not just to vote no, but to throw out this farce on accountability and start over. That would be the democratic thing to do. You cannot fight injustice with injustice. Thank you for your time. Thank you. James Offsink, James is online. Hello, uh, my name is James Offsink, I use he, him pronouns, and today I'm representing the League of Women Voters of Portland. We would like to start off by expressing our gratitude to the Police Accountability Commission for its diligent work developing the voter enacted charter amendment into a detailed plan for Portland's new oversight system. Based on our years of involvement in this issue, we believe that the proposal, the proposal addresses many of the longstanding community concerns, and we'd like to highlight a few of those today. As required by the city charter, the Community Board for Police Accountability and the Civilian Office of Police Accountability will together form the new oversight system. The new civilian office will conduct investigations into misconduct cases and the trained and impartial community board will have the authority to make findings and issue discipline. Police internal affairs will no longer investigate police misconduct, clearing up one uh, longstanding community concern. Police Bureau policies are also sometimes a barrier to accountability. Through its work considering and deciding on cases, shortcomings in these policies will become evident to the board. One of the strengths of the new system is that the policy recommendation the board issues to address systemic accountability problems will require a response from the chief, and if they're not accepted, city council will weigh in to make a final decision. Deadly force incidents are also of great public concern. In contrast to the current system, the new civilian staff will independently conduct those investigations and the board will decide on, disciplines, uh, on discipline and findings. We want to again thank the PAC for carefully following the charter amendments provisions and city council direction, incorporating effective and promising practices from other jurisdictions and consulting reports from outside experts. The PAC sought and received input from a wide array of interested community members with a diversity of opinions. The league was impressed with the deep community engagement the commission conducted and our members attended at least some of the 146 public events and meetings through which the commission arrived at the proposal before you today. We support this research and thoughtful step forward in accountability and urge you to do the same. Thank you. Thank you. Next we have Matt Levine, Carol Landsman, and Susan Griffin. I'm Matt Levine. Thank you for the opportunity to have my voice heard, something not usually afforded to victims of the police in Portland, but especially not afforded to Black, Indigenous, POC victims of police brutality. I'm here today to demand the City Council accept and approve the final report and recommendations of the PAC as is. Perhaps the best way to justify that demand is by making it clear, as Commissioner Michelle Wesley did, that we need to go much farther than the PAC's recommendations. This needs to be step one of literally thousands of steps taken to disrupt and dismantle the white supremacist foundations of this city. Portland was founded as part of a genocidal campaign against indigenous peoples of the Lower Columbia River and Willamette River 
that involved Oregon's Trail of Tears, mass executions, colonial and exploitative land grabs of white supremacists like William Overton, Asa Lovejoy, and Francis Pettigrove, as well as biological warfare in the form of malaria, smallpox, and measles. The Portland Police Bureau itself was also founded in white supremacist fashion, best illustrated by the fact that shortly after the Portland chapter of the KKK was formed, it boasted a membership of 150 Portland police and under the leadership of Portland Mayor George Baker, a 100-person police vigilante squad was formed, the majority of them being Klansmen. Unfortunately, Portland's mayors and police have followed in these footsteps to this very day. Tiana Tozer, just ask the family and friends of Keaton Otis, a kind, loving 25-year-old black man, a son, grandson, father, and good friend murdered by Portland police. Just ask the family and friends of Patrick Kimmins, a kind father of three, loving son and 27-year-old black man murdered by Portland police. Just ask the family and friends of June Knightley, who was murdered at a Justice for Patrick Kimmins rally demanding police accountability not long after Ted Wheeler told Portland that racial justice protesters need to hurt a little bit. We need racial justice in this city and we need police accountability for that. Thank you. Thank you. Me now? Yeah, okay. you're up. Thank you. My name is Susan Griffin for the record. And I just wanted to let you guys know that I lived downtown for 10 years and in the last three years I've been assaulted six times within three blocks of where I live. The first time I was stomped, kicked, and robbed walking home from Safeway. The second time, um, let's see if I can remember them all. The second time some guy came, some crazy guy came up behind me on one of them scooters and slapped my ass as hard as he could. And then he stopped about 30 feet ahead of me and turned around and told me he was gonna get some of that later. In February of this year, I was accosted by a man who was pissed off because I didn't recognize him to be the son of God. And he literally tried to lift me out of my chair, and I'm convinced he would have body slammed me to the ground had he got me out. I was robbed last December in front of Target. They took my phone and cash. Um, is that it? That, that, my, I might be missing one or two. I, I believe in police accountability. I believe in accountability for everyone. Um, I've been in positions like these assaults where I've called for police help and couldn't get it, and I deserved it. Um, I've called to try to get people help uh, through PSR, and PSR has, I called twice. The first time, they didn't even roll up on the scene. 40 minutes later, another call was made to 911. An ambulance was sent. I came to find out a few weeks later when I talked to the man that I called for, because he's my neighbor, that he was in fact having seizures and dying. So all I want to say is if you're going to hold the police accountable, I want everyone held accountable. I want PSR held accountable. I think that those allegations deserve to be looked into, because if PSR um, can't do the job that they do, and they say that one bad apple spoils the whole bushel, do we say screw PSR? No, we tweak it and we try to make it better. And that's it. Thank you, appreciate it. Thank you. Carol Landsman is online. Yes. Hello, I'm Carol Landsman. And I'm still moved by what uh, Commissioner Charlie said. That was very powerful and I take it to heart. Thank you. Um, I also wanna give kudos to the PAC and to their staff for writing what I consider to be such an excellent report. Uh, community involvement, which is always so important, was very well done, I believe. The other thing that seems to be forgotten more and more is a best practices. And that was included and I was very happy to see that. I wanna to touch briefly on the change from the police review board to the new, I don't even know what it's called, to the new board. Um, I think that's such an excellent idea. I've been disturbed for a while that a closed police board evaluates deadly force. And 
it got better when one or two non-police were added to the committee, but it was still so heavily slanted and it was still, uh, the, the families couldn't come to the hearings, which I thought the family of the injured or dead person couldn't come. And I think that this plan does an excellent job of involving those people in the process. Thank you. Thank you, Carol. Next, we have Kristen Olson, Brian Owendoff, and Edie Rogoway. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Mayor Wheeler and City Councilors. Thank you for hearing our testimony today. My name is Kristen Olson. I'm a multi-generation Portlander, and I own a law firm downtown. I'm asking you today to please do not simply rubber stamp this proposal for the following reasons. First, it will destroy the confidence and trust of the Portland Police Bureau. Portland cannot afford to lose more police officers. In 2020, Portland sent a clear signal to the police that we did not value them. I want to commend Mayor Wheeler for quickly reversing course and committing to public safety. We're now on track to be a city that values public safety and crime victims. Please incorporate a balance of public safety and provide amendments that incorporate the views of crime victims and law enforcement in regard to public say in regard to police accountability, which of course the majority of Portlanders also want because they voted for this measure. We want accountability and we want to support police. With the election of Renee Gonzalez, the majority of Portlanders sent a clear signal to city council that they want police. They do not want police defunded, they want to support police, but they want good police. How do we amend what is presented and create a fair and balanced proposal that sends a signal to crime victims and police officers that we value them and we want to incorporate them in regard to our city, but we also want good police and we want police accountability. We broke our homicide record twice after defunding the police, and I know we do not want to continue our downward trajectory in that regard. Thank you, Mayor Wheeler, for working to rebuild trust with your police officers. That's your bureau, and I know that many of them have feel that they have trust in you. I think you can further signal that trust by amending this proposal to incorporate some of their suggestions. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, my name is Brian Owendoff. I've lived and worked in the city of Portland for 15 years and raised my family here. Over the past four years, I've watched Portland go, going from one of the most soft after communities in, to work and live to one of the least desirable. This reduction in livability caused by the pandemic, 179 nights of riots in downtown Portland, unintended consequences of Measure 110, and the continued exodus of police officers. Portland has one of the lowest number of officers per capita of any U.S. city. We're second to last only to San Jose and Bakersfield. After watching the PAC's online meetings and reading the recommendations, in my opinion, the PAC did not stick to their working orders and purview. They overstepped their mission and boundaries in interfering with the oversight of the PPB budget demanding to be present at negotiations with the bargaining unit and wanting to influence state legislature using Portland as a guinea pig for accounting, a police accountability. This ordinance will only be appropriate if there were changes made in the composition of the oversight committee to ensure broader representation from the PPB, the union, business groups, and neighborhood associations and protocol to ensure that taxpayer money is being efficiently deployed to benefit Portlanders, both housed and unhoused. The best way to assure adequate representation on the oversight board is to have a selection process through a committee that would represent the city fairly, including PBB representatives. The final appointments would be made by the city council. Three things I would recommend would be a following. Representation of the entire community that relies on the police for safety, not just those with a bias against police. The appointments of the budget should be made at least subject to approval of the city council. The 5% $13 million budget under the current plan is excessive given the poor staffing ratio of PPB. This needs to be rethought and sent back to the voters. 
There also needs to be an independent budget oversight committee made up of people with experience in financial accountability and administration subject to the city's audit and review. Thank you. Thank you. Edie Rogoway. Carol Cushman, Richard Perkins, Mr. Barnett. And Carol's online. Am I next? Yeah, go ahead, Carol. Um, I'm Carol Cushman, a resident of North Portland, speaking in support of the report from the Police Accountability Commission. I want to thank the PAC volunteers who have spent hours of their personal time developing a plan for the new Community Board for Police Accountability. These members have done extensive research looking at programs in place elsewhere, consulted experts in the field, and included participation by the larger community. I support the concept of one system led by community members to handle all investigations into possible police misconduct with the board involved in the disciplinary decisions. I have followed the citizen review committee meetings and have heard both committee members and appellants frustrated by the process that currently exists. This new program gives one point of contact for a complaint, investigation, decision and appeal and will include support for the person who makes the complaint throughout the process. Incidents involving deadly force will now be included as ev events for which the community member can file a complaint. It is important that our system for police accountability be truly independent and community-based. In addition to handling specific incidents, the board will have the opportunity to make recommendations about police policy, directives, and training. These recommendations will be addressed. If rejected by the police chief, the city council will have the final say on whether to adopt or reject the changes. The larger board hearing causes the larger board uh, case, excuse me, messed up my sense there. Uh, the fact that there should be different groups hearing both the appeals and the evidentiary hearing is reason that they need a larger number. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you. Good afternoon, city councilors and PAC supporters. I'm Dick Perkins, former heroin addict, ex-con, felon for life, resident of downtown Portland and retired bank executive. I voted for the initiative with which led us to today. I still support the concept, but I have several concerns about how the current recommendations evolved and how the composition uh, uh, and about the composition of the final commission, which by the way, I, I've applied for. I believe the process has resulted in a bias where many who have created the proposed ordinance and selection process want to defund the police. As an activist for more behavioral health resources, I understand the need for an empathetic police force, deeply engaged in a positive way with the community, especially the marginalized communities. This commission needs to help break down the barriers that have caused the dehumanization of the police, evidenced by death to cops and all cops are bastard tags we see around the city. This commission should actively recruit those of color and people with lived experience who do believe the police are essential. I know the level of distrust as best I can I think I understand why it exists among marginalized communities. But stereotyping cops, like people of color feel stereotyped, is not the way to create it. The PPB should be represented on this commission, and so should marginalized groups who value the police. And let's not create an oversight commission with no oversight over itself. Thank you. Mr. Barnett was to be online. Hello. 
Hello? Hi, we hear you. Yep, we hear you loud and clear. Can you, you, can you hear me? Yep, you sound great. Oh. Uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Mr. Mr. Barnett, 86 year old African American man living for 50 years in Northeast Portland. In those years, I have seen and many times participated as a citizen activist in both formal and informal initiatives to improve the safety of Black and other ethnic minorities uh, in our area. Residents, um, uh, uh, to, to, to improve their safety um, by urging and demanding that the Portland police management and line officers live up to their own model of protecting and serving all Portlanders and to those and to cease excessive use of force, which is very often illegal. I have participated in the U.S. Justice requirements of the Portland settlement agreement and am aware and fully endorse the Portland Police Accountability Commission's report and urge the council entirely to entirely adopt it uh, for the benefit of the, the people who suffer the abuse as well as for all Portlanders. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Candace Avalos, John Jackson, and Mary Constantino. Good afternoon. Hi again. <laughs> it's our third meeting in a row. I, think. I know. Are you sick of me yet? <laughs> Good afternoon, Mayor Wheeler, commissioners. Thank you for the opportunity to comment today in strong support of the Police Accountability Commission's efforts to bring the police oversight that 82% of Portland voters supported in 2020 to life. I'm Candace Avalo, she, her pronouns, and I've been a member of the Citizen Review Committee for six years and have served as its chair for the last three years. I'm speaking to you in this capacity, but also as a community member who stood alongside thousands of Portlanders across the city, demanding true change to our systems of police accountability. After many years serving on the city's old version of police oversight, I'm proud and impressed with the outcome of the PAC's work in the last 18 months, engaging a vast group of stakeholders, community members, and experts to identify key changes in the new oversight system. In particular, the things that I believe will have the biggest impact include an oversight board that is directly empowered to impose discipline or propose policy remedies, a one-stop shop that eliminates the duplication of services across several bureaus and city advisory boards, and a much more effective preponderance of the evidence standard of review. I'm here to remind you that our city is not asleep. We are watching diligently to ensure the will of the voters and democratic processes we proclaim to cherish are honored. Transforming our city's oversight of police is no small task, and I am not suggesting that it doesn't merit a critical eye and thoughtful discussion on how to move this new model forward together. But what I am saying is that we can have these discussions about adjustments, oops, about adjustments um, without disrupting the spirit and intent from the voters who gave our city a mandate to implement a robust community-focused response to the calls for greater oversight of Portland police. I urge you to engage in a good faith discussion with the PAC and city staff to approve and implement this new code. Thanks again. Thank you. Hello, Mayor, Commissioners. My name is John Jackson. I'm a small business owner here in Portland. I recently got up to speed on what PAC has come up with and I was really shocked to see some of their recommendations and procedures. Along with being a small business owner, I'm a military veteran and served in many public and private boards in, public, in Portland. So when I think about reform, I think about it from that perspective. In the military, it's important to keep in mind that we're serving to the public and we swore an oath to the Constitution. We serve civilians and we know that we're held to a higher standard than the general public. When it comes to accountability, the systems really work well in the military because of checks and balances. Every soldier is accountable to superior, to their peers, to their subordinates. And collectively, we have to answer to the public. In business, it's much the same. So it worries me quite a bit when I think about the proposal and the limited checks and balances in place that I know from experience are required for a functional system. 
community engaged policy, um, community engaged policing is great. It may be the best model for public safety, but how can you have that if the system of police oversight was designed with no insight from regular police officers, by, but by a small vocal group of uh, the community? Every board I've served on had experts in the field. Having experience in law enforcement and professionals on the board seems like it's a logical and fair choice. I don't feel any safer knowing that officers I see working hard every day and doing a great job um, are going to be limited and have their jobs on the line with, a, uh, with the PAC and the PAC themselves really uh, aren't answerable to anyone other than themselves. So that's kind of where I'm at on that. Thank, Thank you, sir. Mary's online. I'm Mary Costantino. I'm a um, physician in Portland. I've been here for 20 plus years. I have two children and I'm also a business owner with a surgery center in Portland as well as in Eugene. So I am on here today to talk about an event that was about a month ago um, when I was in Goose Hollow and had a um, attack by a person uh, walking just around the Mac um, gym um, and was knocked unconscious. Um, I ended up just going home. Um, I did call 911 when I came to. I've uh, worked in trauma centers for many years, so I just kind of put my medical trauma brain on and called 911, um, mostly because I wanted the location services for my cell phone um, to go back to the 911 call center. Um, I was not calling to for help because I've actually just have lived here long enough where I don't presume that there's enough of a police force to come to my aid. Um, so I was mostly calling to have a recording of what was happening and also to um, have somebody find me if I was unable to drag myself out of what I was in. Um, I did go home. I didn't go to the ER. Um, a side note is our ERs are overfilled and we have no doctors anymore in this town because of the livability issues. Um, so I do also have a black son. Um, I wasn't getting on here to mention that, but I have a black 18 year old who goes to Lincoln. Um, I, I support a heavy police force with, even with a black son. Um, these kids are running around. He's seen guns probably eight or nine times, none of them from the police. Um, I do get very concerned from about my, my black son and my white son walking around downtown. So, uh, you know, I, I'm taking notes here when I'm listening and I'm thinking about where's the public accountability commission? You know, who do I call after this? Um, I didn't even file a police report um, because the system was too complicated. So I still have concussions. I showed up to work the next day, but um, anyway, thank you for everything. And I think we need more police officers. Thank you, appreciate it. Angie Tomlinson, Levi A., and Reverend Nathan Jimenez, National Congressional Scholar. Good afternoon. I'm, uh, thank you, uh, Mayor Wheeler and commissioners for hearing me. Um, I am Angie Tomlinson. My daughter Slade. Tom this is uh, my daughter Slade Tomlinson is here with me for support. I've lived in Portland for almost 30 years, raised two children in public school, with um, many years in PTA and community sports, and an, I am an environmental scientist and engineer. I've even spent some of my time as a scientist serving the city um, and working for the city of Portland. I'm not an activist. I'm a scientist. I, I was almost three years old and unaware of the world, really, when one moment changed everything for me. That moment threw my future world off its trajectory and into a future without one of my biological, par uh, one of my bi biological parents. My mother was only 21 years old when she had to identify my bi biological father's body a body that had been bruised and scrapes all over it, a body that had been killed by police using a chokehold. He was a Mexican-American and he was 24 years old. Sorry. 
All it took was one moment's decision to change my life without me even being aware. My mother struggled with mental health issues for the rest of her short life, and I grew up in abject poverty. For the last two years, I have gave hundreds of hours of my time, of my family's time, volunteering for the Portland Police Accountability Commission, made up of, uh, up of community members, creating a groundbreaking system of community oversight of Portland Police. I believe that all citizens deserve to feel safe and protected by police, but we must also ensure public enforcement officials are held, I'm sorry, I believe that all citizens deserve to feel safe and protected also by police, but we um, must all also ensure public enforcement officials are held accountable when they step out of line. With your support, the creation of this police oversight system is a change in the right direction to ensure that our most vulnerable cit citizens, as I once was, are protected. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I am Levi. I'm here to help represent minimum wage workers and teenagers in our community. Although the Portland Account Account Accountability Commission is an ostensibly unbiased group, the reality is that there is an anti-police agenda being pushed for personal profit and gain, which needs to be addressed and seized as soon as possible. The committee does not accurately portray the needs of our Portland community at large, and an anti-police ideology diminishes the voices of the minority groups who tend to be the people who need them the most. Accountability should not be defunding. With that being said, I have worked overnight shifts in a food service job located close to Old Town. Over the months, I have witnessed people suffering from extreme poverty, crippling addictions, drug-induced mental illness, and violence at every corner. I've seen people die, and I have seen people living fates worse than such. You would not believe the effect illicit drugs have on people using it until you have seen it. Most of these people are part of marginalized community. Many are people of color, disabled, poor, etc. Each time I have watched someone overdose or have an episode, there is pain and sympathy in my heart, but there is very little I myself, as a minor and feminine presenting person, can do. Situations often arise where it is too dangerous for me or my coworkers to deal with it. In almost any case of violence or illicit drug use, we need to call the police and ask for help. I can only speak for myself. Each experience I have had with the police has been positive, and I've had countless numbers of them. Each time they help with overdoses, I've seen them treat the person overdosing with sympathy and grace. Officers uh, offer each person that overdoses resources and uh, once they are cognitive and ask them if they want medical attention. And my story is just one example of how they help in our community and what they do. Um, it's important not to forget that these people who suffer from addiction are brothers and sisters and sons and daughters, and the people that are best at helping them and treating them are, are the police. They are the ones that help them. They're the ones that I've seen help me countless of times. Um, I find it incredibly offensive that people who came from a place of uh, privilege think that they have the right to impose on the foundations of civilized society through this. We have seen the dead. We have seen what the decline in numbers of police has done to our city. I'm here in an effort to help um, you know, represent our children who depend on the police to keep us safe. Um, the values you claim to have already align with much of uh, the performance of our officers. Thank you. Thank you all for your time. Trish Garner, Juan Chavez, and Philip Chachka. Hello. Uh, I assume you can hear me? Yep. My I'm name is great. Thanks so much. My name is Trish Garner. She, her pronouns. I was recently appointed to the city's focused intervention team community oversight group, FITCOG, but I speak here today as an individual uh, citizen of Portland. I also speak as a former federal prosecutor and state criminal defense attorney. In my experience, I have heard many police officers say that we, the public, just don't understand. We don't understand what they see on a daily basis. There is truth to that, but not the whole truth. Truth is shaped by all our experiences and perspectives. The proposal to establish a CPBA and the Civilian Office of Police Accountability represents an effort to recognize these perspectives, not to reject police input, but to amplify it with information gathered from the community and other relevant evidence. 
fielding a single structure which has the power and authority to promptly and impartially make decisions is crucial. Law enforcement, too, will benefit from having one system which can fully investigate, adjudicate, impose discipline as necessary, and importantly, make policy recommendations. This clarity is only fair for both the community and police officers. Everyone will know and be subject to the same rules. The PAC's proposal was achieved only after many hours of work. I sincerely appreciate this dedication. I have also heard police officers say that one of their primary goals is to establish trust in the communities in which they serve. This proposal provides a genuine opportunity to reestablish this sorely needed trust. I support the PAC proposal. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Juan Chavez. I'm an attorney at the Oregon Justice Resource Center and counsel to, a mem to and member of the Mental Health Alliance and Amicus Curiae in the federal lawsuit brought by the United States Department of Justice against the city of Portland. Today, though, I am here in my capacity as a OJRC attorney and as a citizen of the city. Adoption of the PAC's recommendations is a priority for OJRC, the community, and for anybody who has ever sought justice from our city government. I can tell you that as a civil rights practitioner, our current system is non-functional. And indeed, OJRC does hold IPR and its members in high esteem. Their investigators are highly skilled and have a deep knowledge base about operations within the police bureau. But that doesn't mean anything if their work and findings are undermined by the police bureau's intransigence and ability to put their fists on the scale. This city has paid out millions of dollars in cases at IPR, the Police Review Board, Internal Affairs, and ultimately the Police Chief and Police Commissioner have exonerated or not sustained findings of misconduct by Portland police officers. What we have now is not a system that people trust, let alone find justice in. And when you don't have justice in our city, you will have to hear from people in the courts and in the streets. We needed a police accountability process with true independence. That's what 82% of Portlanders voted for. And that's what PAC's recommendations could bring. Arguments against adoption of this report are frankly nonsensical. We can't hold police officers accountable because uh, crime is bad or because people marched in defense of black lives. If you do care about crime, you should also care about crime committed by Portland police officers. And uh, as adults, as public servants, I hope and expect that they have the humility to accept that kind of criticism. You have our written statement. It's in the record. It was drafted by our excellent attorney, Amanda Lamb, who has experience from working in IPR and various auditing groups. We have our recommendations in there. They're very simple. Ensure independence, provide an adequate budget, give the group meaningful tools, such as uh, subpoena power, and provide a route to mediation for people harmed. I guarantee you, if you give people an opportunity to be heard at the earliest stage possible, you would be sued less. Please adopt this report. Thank you. Thank you. Philip is online. Thank you, uh, Mayor and Commissioners. My name is Philip Chachka. I use he, him pronouns, and I'm a member of Portland Cop Watch. Uh, former P PAC Commissioner Dan Handelman is also part of Portland Cop Watch. Uh, our group appreciates the opportunity to testify in this report. I myself am a victim of PPB brutality when an officer rushed up behind me without warning or probable cause and hit me in the back and in the neck with a baton. You've, heard, you've already heard from many of the former PAC members today. I want to echo their collective request to accept this report and pass it without modification to the DOJ. It's worth mentioning the City Council unanimously appointed each of the 30 community members that served on the PAC during the 20-month run. Also unanimous was the Commission's approval of their report and City Code changes. I hope Council feels a sense of pride for having set the parameters for a Commission's membership allowing the commission to do its work, appearing before the commission and get to give your personal perspectives and for supplying committed staff to support the volunteers as they spent many hundreds of hours designing the new system. This new system cannot reform or repair the Portland Police Bureau or fix its culture pro program problems overnight. It will, however, provide a means for more people who are harmed by police misconduct to safely report their grievances to an oversight board that's independent of the police bureau. Hopefully that independence will lead to more accountability for officers who abuse their power. 
The recommendation to provide each complainant with the navigator should keep complainants engaged and educated through this sometimes re-traumatizing process of reporting police misconduct. Chief Lavelle and Chief Deputy Chief Fromm appeared before the PAC in June of last year. DC Fromm plainly stated that he and Chief Lavelle needed to be removed from the discipline process in order to be able to speak freely. This new system allows the chief's, chief's office to speak freely about police misconduct and hopefully PPB will be on a path to finally becoming a learning institution. Thank you. Thank you. Mark Porras, Danielle Dandriffman, and Amy Wood. Yep, thanks. Uh, good afternoon, Mayor and Commissioners. My name is Mark Porras. I use he, him pronouns, uh, and I'm also with the group Portland Cop Watch. Uh, the Police Accountability Commission heard from a former PPB sergeant who had problems getting their complaint against other officers adjudicated fairly um, and instead had the system come after her. This may have been part of a long-standing internal grudge against the sergeant for being a whistleblower. The new system allows officers to file complaints against other officers directly with the board to avoid these kind of internal politics that affect neutral fact-finding. People often mistake Portland Cop Watch's desire for police accountability as a form of being anti-police, uh, but really most officers probably would prefer that they all follow the rules and gain community trust by policing in a respectful and constitutional manner. This system should make space for more brave individual cops to step forward and make, the, and make following the rules the norm. The Police Accountability Commission went out of its way to try to make things better for complainants, giving them extra avenues to appeal dismissals during intake or investigation, along with appealing the findings. That means they have three ways to appeal to the board. By law, officers who can also appeal findings to the board can additionally ask for a due process hearing about the proposed discipline or file either a grievance that could lead to arbitration or an appeal with the city's civil service board. So that means officers have four means to appeal with two going outside the board's direct, direct jurisdiction. So the system actually is still weighted in the police's favor. Adopting the PAC's proposal is at least a step towards leveling the playing field. Now, uh, finally, we wanna uplift a point that Dr. Rochelle Silver, a psychologist and member of the Mental Health Alliance, um, who also served on the CRC and COAB made in her written testimony, uh, which is that the community members you appointed to design this new system, they are now the experts on police oversight and accountability and tinkering with their proposed recommendations would be a mistake. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Hi, I'm Amy Wood. Thank you for having us here today. I'm here to testify in opposition to this proposal as is. Beyond this room in Portland, I think there are very few people who are following this proposal, and only a very, very small number of people have read the full 500 pages and are aware of all the details and the implications contained in it. For many Portlanders just beginning to regain confidence in this city, I believe if the council accepts the proposal as is, it would come as a big surprise and a tremendous setback to our recovery. We're experiencing safety and livability conditions that would have been unthinkable to us three years ago. When citizens voted on this ballot measure in 2020, Portlanders wanted fewer police and greater scrutiny, and those are great things the greater scrutiny, by the way, not the fewer police. But it's worth noting that we also voted for Measure 110 in 2020. Today, though, we face a public safety crisis, and many of us now regret the unintended consequences and outcomes of our well-intentioned votes. Portland has just 1.26 officers per every 1,000 residents, and our police department ranks 48th among the nation's 50th largest city cities for our staffing to population ratio. As a result, we're struggling to provide even basic service and taking up to 30 minutes to respond to high priority phone calls. Please consider that the majority of Portland's progressive voters are begging you to prioritize public safety issues. We do care about police accountability, but we need it to be implemented well. And we wanna learn from the lessons of Measure 110's failure. We wanna make sure that there's some real careful scrutiny into the implementation of it. Allowing another untested program to be implemented without, without edits is a really big concern. Thank you. Thank you. Simab Husseini, Ali Sikh, Delude, and Pastor Robin Wisner. And after these three, we'll, we'll take a break. We've got uh, tech people, broadcast people, and staff people who are gonna need a break, and I can use one too. So we'll, we'll hear these three, and then we'll take a brief recess. Good afternoon. Greetings. Um, 
Yes, uh, peace and blessings, dear mayor and esteemed uh, members of city council. Uh, my name is Simab Husseini, he, him. And I am a husband and father whose children attend Portland Public Schools. I'm a community organizer, founder of Muslim Civil Rights Organization, a social justice and civil rights advocate and activist. Um, and I just wrapped up being a police accountability commissioner uh, representing uh, community justice organizations. Um, I was a full phase co-chair for phases two and six uh, to build this new community board for police accountability. I was appointed on my birthday, July 28th, 2021, um, and had since worked with pride on my birthdays, camping trips, vacations, kids' soccer games, uh, as my children can attest. Um, however, my wife is not available for comment. Um, I'm here to say two things. First, thank you. It's been an honor to serve this city in such a meaningful way. You appointed this commission for two years, and we have had the incredible support of the city staff led by Director Mike Myers, his deputy director, Erica Perez. Through them, the amazing Samir Kanal led his staff and facilitators that were vital to our pace, structure, and success. I'm also blessed to have met and worked with this incredible commission of caring and diverse community members. Their experiences, professionalism, and mad spreadsheet capabilities are just a few superlatives to highlight. And second, this is complete, ready for the US DOJ, and is yours. You appointed this commission those two birthdays ago. All of you should be proud to own this. This is what your appointees in your process came up with for your consideration. Thank you for trusting us this far, this process, and helping us get this finished. Black, brown, indigenous, and immigrant refugee communities are disproportionately impacted by injustices carried out in places where accountability and representation should matter the most the same places where there has been historic failures. I want these communities to feel safe when they need to pick up the phone and dial 911, because what has preceded that is trauma. This is a massive step closer for them, you, and us. Let's make history together. Thank you. Thank you. I guess it's me. I think so. Go ahead. Uh, uh, I am Pastor Robin Wisner. Thank you again for being allowing us to speak. I'm speaking in two parts today. Um, the first part is as a person who has been here for 30 years. My son was born in 1990, and I wanted to be his quarterback for the things that I experienced from the South and how that I knew that when I moved to Portland, it would be better and I would be his running back for, to make sure he had a right life. Uh, during that period of time, I was able to be a part of the Albina Ministerial Alliance. Also uh, worked with the Crisis Response Team, Portland Police Bureau. I also was the one who preached Kendra James' funeral. I also was a part of Jahar Perez. I also saw uh, the family of Aaron Campbell going through such tragedy. Uh, those who are not here today, um, James Posey, Pastor Hennessy of the NAACP are sending their support behind this as well. But today I'm speaking in the behalf of co-chair of, of the PSEP group. Our statement on behalf of the Portland community of community, Committee of Community Engagement Policing, we are urging the city council to adopt this co-package and honor not only the work of the Police Accountability Commission but the spirit of the accountability that the Portland community has been working toward for decades. We say this as a representative of Portland diversity community, including the black community, people experiencing mental illness and all other people implemented under the settlement agreement. There has been much discomfort expressed around this proposal for the new accountability system. PCEP, has ur PCEP urges you to consider this. Real accountability always feel uncomfortable. It should. Whenever any of us are told that we need to step down and do a better job, um, a better job, 
it demands growth, reflection, and change. None of this is comfortable. The fact that there is so much discomfort around this proposal tells the PAC has been on the right track all along. PCEP is a group of volunteers that works on similar issues. We know better than any, anyone that it's impossible to do this work perfectly. Work that deal, dealing with police, one of the most challenging issues of our time, and engaging diverse voices and collaborating decisions, making process a little messy. It's necessary, it, it's, it is never perfect, but we ask the city council not to let uh, perf perfect be an enemy of good. PSEP believes that the proposal is good and our community deserves the real accountability of policing. We have waited for a long f time. Thank you again uh, for your time and allowing me to speak. Great Thank to see you. everyone. And was there one other person? Very good. All right. It is. Uh, why, why don't we just take a brief recess here? We will be back at 417. We are in recess.
Um, hopefully that will leave plenty of opportunity for the commissioners to ask questions of staff as well. So why don't we go ahead and turn it back to Rebecca. Next we have Patrick Patterson, Marsha Gulick and Loretta Guzman. Welcome. You look ready, why don't you go ahead and start? <laughs> Who, me? Yeah, please. Oh, okay. Well, my name is Loretta Guzman. I am a small business owner, and I just would like to say I recognize many of the faces on the pack. Um, and I never once was asked um, for any of my input on any of this, and I wish I could have been. But anyway, I'm here, and I hope each, of, each and every one of you thoroughly read, read this, um, what is being presented to us today. We have 20 people that have volunteered and were appointed to sit on this board, the PAC, the Police Accountability Commission. This is a volunteer position. I do agree we all need equal and fair justice, and so does PPB. And they could use better training and better help, help from the people so they can better serve us. The PAC has taken an enormous amount of workload. As on page 47, they realized that reviewing potentially traumatic and emotional videos, reports, and records that they may need mental health. This is very concerning that they will be subjecting themselves to trauma as volunteers. This is why there are trained experts and qualified individuals specifically for these areas and should be left to those trained experts and not the board, the PAC. They each sit on this board for three years at a time, making this a full-time job and want to be compensated. We as taxpayers need to have a say so how $12.5 million is being spent before it is spent. We have to remember this is a volunteer position, not a job. The overreach they are asking to be approved in this final report will cause our PPB to go away as they cannot do their jobs. Other states will welcome our trained force to their states, such as Idaho did before. Our law and order will be completely dismantled. And this seems like this is what a lot of it is saying to us. They can easily, this can easily fill like 110. So, and I also am a mother, a grandmother. I have black and brown children, and I do not want them killed at the, at the hands of the police, nor do I want them killed at the hands of black or brown of their peers. So I am here and I do believe that we need law and order and we do need justice and it needs to be equally upon all of us, so. Thank you, appreciate it. Good afternoon. Marsha. Hi, Hi Marsha. <laughs> okay. My name is Marsha Gulick and I'm a resident of downtown Portland. I voted for the 2020 ballot measure that led to the appointment of a police accountability commission. I still support the idea, but believe there are changes that need to be made. I believe it is possible to address concerns over social and racial justice and still support an increase in sworn officers to address criminality and to be sensitive to racial, social, and behavioral health issues in a safe way for all citizens. I believe that the Police Accountability Board should be made up of folks who represent the entire community that relies on the police for safety. I believe appointments to the Police Oversight Board and the budget of the board should be subject to approval by City Council. I believe the 5% of the Police Bureau's budget, the 12 million that is referenced, which comes from general funds, is excessive and should be reduced. I believe there should be an independent budget oversight committee made up of people with experience in financial accountability whose findings would be subject to the city auditor's review. Thank you for your attention. Thanks for being here. Patrick's online. Yes, online and unmuted. Go ahead, Patrick. All right, thanks. So I'm Patrick Patterson, for the record. I'm a fourth generation black Oregonian. Um, I'm here because I want to testify that I believe the Police Accountability Commission is important and is definitely necessary for uh, public safety. At the same time, I think
think some of the proposals in the Police Accountability Commission's final recommendation are questionable at best or just plain haven't been fully thought out. Police officers are people just like anybody else, and they also deserve a justice system that'll treat them fairly. It's simply undemocratic and does not make sense for people who have talked about abolishing the police to oversee designing a police oversight system. If I was a police officer in Portland, I wouldn't trust this oversight board. I wouldn't trust it to be neutral. I'm a black Portlander and I don't trust it. As someone who grew up here and loves Portland, I don't believe we should be implementing a system that is going to give police officers strong incentive to go somewhere else. I think the Police Accountability Commission needs a budget advisory committee. I'm on the budget advisory committee for the Portland Police Bureau. And every month, PPB leadership attends our meetings, they answer our questions, talk about how they're spending their budget, and listen to the feedback we give them. I don't see why there should be another department that doesn't have any community input. Thank you. Next, we have Vicki Payne, Reverend Dr. W.J. Mark Knudsen, and Steve Herring. Hi, my name is Vicki Payne. The Multnomah County employee, the views I'm expressing today are my own. I have a diverse array of family and friends who have experienced what they'll admit sometimes was necessary and required to learn their lesson and sometimes very corrupt actions against them because of their skin color or past record. So I'm well aware of the changes we should be striving for in our criminal justice system. I've actually attended a couple of these PAC meetings, including one of the gift card meetings, and they were unfortunately seemingly filled with anti-police activists. It seemed to me that there wasn't there was no way that the group actually did the deep outreach outside of their friend groups. Um, and it was very obvious to me that specific cultural organizations and, and that are not involved in anti-police rhetoric were not contacted and asked to send participants to these meetings. I asked this question in written and testimony. I can't seem to find it in their published documents, which I've heard others claim their public comment is missing as well. It would have been highly available, valuable for the PAC to ask to be invited to neighborhood association meetings and heavily policed neighborhoods and outer East Portland cultural groups like ERCO, ICO, Division Midway Alliance, Apano, the dozens of Somali groups that exist out that way, et cetera. I've spoken to many of these individuals and groups personally and members of these communities overwhelmingly support good police officers and would have had very different feedback to this committee. That is if they felt safe doing so because I personally did not feel safe giving public comment in these hostile forums. Uh, someone in one of the meetings suggested that the PAC commission do a police ride along. Did that ever happen? I think it would be highly prudent to make that a requirement for every member of this new oversight commission so that they can understand what our law enforcement officers deal with when they are on the job. It's very easy for us as regular people to assume we know both sides of what goes on, especially those who have had negative interactions with law enforcement in the past, myself included. Uh, we need to remember no two people are the same, nor should this new commission be operating on the basis of guilty until proven innocent because of their personal biases. Most residents want more good cops and understand every job will come with bad apples. Of course, we want to weed them out, but we can't go in, assuming the worst in everyone based on their choice to take this career path. The big change is presented today, but a lot of questionable additions that will hinder our ability to recruit and retain good and law enforcement officers. Thank you. Thank you. Reverend Newtson's online. Yes, Reverend Dr. Mark Knudsen, uh, Mayor Wheeler, thank you for your work and your leadership. To thank commissioners, you. Commissioners, thank you as well. Uh, we hold you up in prayer every day to be community servants. Thank you. So thank you. Uh, I would have come in person today, but I've been Har in Harney County uh, most of the day virtually on Measure 114 for Lift Every Voice Oregon to end gun violence in this city and state. As we know, violence is violence. And the impetus time behind police reform is not only in violence in our communities, but to end violence perpetrated by police officers who so often were not held accountable. And so I would like to say very clearly to the Police Accountability Commission, Commission, you have done amazing work. I know many of you, you model and you reflect who we are as a wonderfully diverse city and state and nation. And the work you have done is highly commendable. And right at the very beginning, I want to say, please, Council, adopt this report in full and then implement it as well. My colleague, Dr. Roy Haynes, outlined the work of the Alabama Ministerial Alliance, which I've been a part of for over three decades now, and 
a founding member with him and Dr. Bethel and others of the Albina Ministerial Alliance Coalition for Justice and Police Reform after the death of Kendra James, Aaron Campbell, and others. And we've been in federal court now over these last 12 years with the Department of Justice in the city, working to reform and change what is. We know the distrust is there. We know the polarization is there. But you are in a Kairos moment. And accepting this report and moving it forward, we can have a time of new visioning and hope. So it's not the end piece. It's an excellent piece, which I highly commend. But we must keep at it to go to community peacekeeping of 21st century policing. And that means transforming the culture of the police department, transforming the makeup of the police department to reflect who we are and our birth rate today and beyond, and to create an environment where people can trust one another and work together. As Dr. T. Allen Bethel would always say, our goal is for everyone to go home at night. That includes the citizens of the city and the police officers as well. So we're out about this because of uh, the desire to weave the beloved community. Again, Dr. Haynes referenced so powerfully and to make this city a city I love and was born in one of the best places to live where the community is together, we trust one another and we weave a peaceful society. Thank you again for the time. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Steve Herring. <laughs> I am the CEO of Living Room Theaters here in downtown Portland. I'm a lifetime Portlander. Uh, I kind of tossed off my comments that I had prepared for you today after hearing the testimony of the PAC. Um, I try to be humble enough to admit things that I don't know, and there's a lot of information conveyed by the presenters today. And the volume of work and their report is far too large for me to have comments on that. So what I'd like to talk about a little bit is some of the things that I do have experience with. As CEO of Living Room Theaters, we've had, we've closed our Boca Raton location, but I've interacted with the police departments in Boca Raton, Florida, Indianapolis, Indiana, and here in Portland, Oregon. Most of the time over the last three years, as you are well aware, anytime we need a police presence, it's pretty much not available. And that comes from, as many people have said today, that you're well aware, not enough officers, and a community where the environment is, you have a highly vocal amount of people who are activists and for whatever reason have had poor experiences with the police, whether it's racism or other incidents that have occurred, they uh, do not treat the police with respect. Um, and likewise, the police have to uh, do their job in that environment. And it is a very difficult environment, much like, Mayor, you have said uh, a couple weeks ago when you were talking about decisions that you make, you have to make decisions as they affect all Portlanders and not just a subset. And so it's very difficult when I hear someone saying, hey, we're gonna have this police accountability board or some review process that uh, works for everyone. I don't think that's necessarily possible, but, I do agree with the principles of how we got here and the measure that was put forth from voters that they approved because we need to have accountability and we need to have the public trust our officers so that the officers can trust the public and we can work together. So I hope you'll take the next 60 days and thoroughly review the report that's in front of you and possibly make recommendations for some changes. Thank you. Thanks, appreciate it. Next we have AC. EA and Jenny York. Hi, uh, my name is Aiden. Um, I'm an immigrant from South Korea and I arrived here in America at a year at a young age. When discussing topics regarding BIPOC people's experiences and political issues, Asian Americans have been repeatedly and intentionally ignored. I grew up in a community impacted by poverty and crime and came to Oregon with my family in hopes of obtaining a better future. Asian Americans have experienced racism, violence, and oppression both historically and in modern times. However, it appears as though our community is cast aside and exploited for political profits in reports such as these. I believe in accountability, and I believe in honesty within our police department. However, um, I'm speaking against this report as our community has been exploited enough. We are deserving of safety and integrity. We are deserving of accountability, not for just for the police, but for those who are managing public funds. I ask that we consider how large sums of money are being used, in whose name they are being used, and what forms of bias are involved in such a commission. I don't think that this program would be beneficial for neither the BIPOC community nor the Portland community as a whole. Thank you. 
Thank you. We appreciate it. My name is Mimi. I attended the community engagement session for the PAC um, program that was held on July 19th. I was paid $200 to attend that event, which was held privately on Zoom for people with lived experience engaging with law enforcement. I mentioned several concerns with PAC's proposal, and I even see some of them listed on the commission's final report. However, I don't see that any of them were actually addressed. I specifically mentioned that the way they were structuring their budget it appeared to have a lot of opportunity for fraudulent behavior. So first of all, I need to restate this concern. As far as the rest of the proposal is concerned, anything the city council adopts will need to be defensible in court. And I honestly have no idea how this would be feasible. Frankly, there is no way the city's liability fund is large enough to sustain how much is wrong with it. I hear that 82% of voters supported the original ballot measure but 82% can't vote to make the city have more money than it does. There are also serious issues with the data sharing sections in this. Police databases are regulated by law as well. So any of the proposals involving law enforcement data would need to be defensible in federal court. Again, I don't think this would be possible. It seems obvious why the regulations exist in the first place. Even 12.5 million seems too small to cover this kind of risk this would be for an organization. City Council is ultimately responsible for the budget, so I truly hope that there is a strong demonstration of integrity and transparency towards the public moving forward. Thank you. Next, we have Daryl Fowler, Edith Gillis, and Christy McMurtry. We'll go to Anatolia Stevens, Reverend Beverly Jackson, and yeah, Marsh. I, I see oh. Edith. Edith, yes, can oh, you, you see Edith? Yeah, go ahead, Edith. Edith, we hear you. Hello, I'm Edith Gillis. Of the, throughout the last four decades, I have been repeatedly become a crime victim of Portland police, and including attempted murder. Um, I've they've also refused to do their job regarding uh, addressing rape, kidnapping, theft, stalking, etc. Even with following the Police Accountability Commission's report, the system will still be biased towards police, but this report is the best way to get better value and public safety per tax dollar and making Portland more livable. The PAC is the best example of transparency, democracy, inclusivity, accessibility, and earning the trust and respect of Portlanders that you need in order to have a safer Portland. Follow the example of the PAC and be a better city. We can be glad to fund and support. I am wanting you to accept the full final report of the Police Accountability Commission. Thank all of the Police Accountability Commission volunteers, staff, and other Portlanders participating in it, and promptly implement the policies and recommendations. As City Council, ensure the proposals are considered through open public processes, following the excellent example of the PAC in scheduling location outreach translation, childcare transportation, parking, and earning the trust in soliciting and implementing feedback from targeted groups, usually silenced and unheard. Refer this to the US DOJ in court, city code based on the PAC's recommendation to implement the transition plan and make sure that the Community Board for Police Accountability does not include any current or former members of law enforcement, DA staff, their family members, or military police suppliers, sales reps, lobbyists. Make sure that its budget is at least 5%, not only of the entire general budget percentage <laughs> for the police, but all the monies and budgeted for the police, including the value of grants, donations, in-kind services, donations of sales and so of stolen or confiscated items, fees, fines, and taxes covering the cost of policing in Portland, including the cost of additional insurance for police misconduct, criminality, and for lawyer and court costs because of police wrongdoings. Doing so will save us money so that we can go after what really causes crime and what really causes public safety, and that's not police. Make sure that investigating deaths caused by police custody or shortly after custody interrogation are independently um, examined by medical examiners who are fully funded and the reports are made available or free for the victim survivors and the public and council members as soon as possible. This PAC 
has done an excellent job of showing you what a city is supposed to do, what is democracy, follow their example, and thank you very much. Thank you. I commend their integrity, courage, persistence, creativity, and brilliant solutions. They are far from having all the answers we need. They are right. There are more things that need to be addressed, but begin with this ASAP. Good day. Thanks, Thanks Edith. Reverend Jackson. Hello, my name is Reverend Beverly Jackson. I am the chair elect of Ecumenical Ministries of Oregon. I'm also a member of the AMA, and I am a native Oregonian. My family represents six generations of Oregonians. And for my 66 years, the PB, PB has never been fair and just toward black and brown citizens. We don't want to defund the police. We want to reform them. We want to ensure the city council respects the will of the citizen and instates the oversight commission permanently. We need oversight and accountability of the PPB to make sure all of our citizens are treated fairly, justly, and with respect. An independent commission that is comprised of diverse community members will be unbiased and transparent as they review any actions that may be called into questions. Over the years, the PPB has demonstrated that they are not always able to police themselves without prejudice. Community Oversight Commission would be able to recommend training and disciplinary actions when necessary without the threat of retribution. The Oversight Commission is a step toward building trust between the police and the community at large. We recommend that you accept this report from this commission. Thank you. Thank you. Christy McMurtry, Anatolia Stevens, and Marsha Handeljob. Pulaski E, Meg Robinson, and Jill Weir. Welcome. Am I the... You can go ahead and start. Uh, okay. <coughs> Sorry. Bless you. Thanks. Um, my name is Meg Robinson, and I'm here to testify about why police accountability means so much to me. My mom is a Jamaican immigrant who was able to come to the U.S. on a student visa and athletic scholarship. After meeting my dad in college and then getting married and having kids, she was able to become an American citizen. As I was growing up, she never missed her home, her, oh, sorry, she never missed her home country, and she was clear with her children on why. Leaving was the only avenue she had available to escape poverty and a co completely unaccountable police system. She grew to resent the Kingston police for many, many reasons, but because of the limit, um, I'll try and narrow it down to two major incidents. One was a time that her uncle got into an argument with his landlord, and the next day the landlord sent a hitman to her uncle's home and shot him in the head. And the second incident was when her aunt got into an argument with her boss, and the next day, my mom found her aunt dead on the kitchen floor in a pool of blood in a sliced throat. My mom's family never suspected the police were involved in those murders, but both cases will remain cold forever because my, parent, uh, my mom's parents were poor and there was a general understanding that if you wanted to have your case solved, you needed to have enough money for a bribe to pay the police. Because in a country with high poverty and unemployment, any police officer would need a good reason to leave their public sector job. So to my friends in the PAC, uh, who I've come to know well, for one, um, I bet you didn't know that I was a first generation white supremacist, and for two, hypothetically, under your system, how would you suggest that my mother categorize her very legitimate complaints? And who would she name as the officer to investigate? Would it be the patrol officer who first got called to the scene and would you fire them? Also, how would you ensure that the next former poor kid who took an empty uh, public sector position was ready to implement institutional change? If it were in Portland, 
Would you just generally blame the police union? And if so, which union? Would it be the PPA, who many of you have publicly claimed is the real problem? Or would it be the commanding officers union, which very few of you seem to know exists? You seem extremely confident, and so I'm gonna take your word for it and thank you all for your hard work. I commend you for meaningfully addressing issues like community distrust and the deeply rooted culture issues at PPB without ever having to compromise any of your existing opinions. Separately, I wanna commend City Council and Mayor Wheeler specifically for your truly innovative, innovative public safety strategy. Thank you for taking a stand on the livability issues we care about most. I'm grateful to see that you're serious about petty crime um, about a year and a half before you leave office. And I agree that we must follow the fundamentals of trickle up criminal justice in order to fix the city and solve crimes. Thank you. Such as, for instance, where hundreds of millions of dollars in COVID relief went. Thank you. Our final speaker signed up is Dr. Jim Gaudino. The last, but not the least. Welcome, sir. Greetings and uh, kind regards to all of you. Thank you for your work. And thanks to the commission uh, for this incredible document. I'm Dr. Jim Gaudino. I'm a prevention uh, and public health specialist physician with 35 years uh, looking upstream to prevent illness and uh, to uh, assure more health, better health, and well-being. And the public health system, uh, just as a reality check in this state, uh, I, I laugh when I look at the police budget and say, oh, 300 million. Well, you know what? The core funding for public health in the entire state is 300 million. Uh, we can do better. The, uh, I'm, I, I think we want a professional uh, and proud and competent police force. We need that. And we're, I'm, I don't think this commission is saying that, and I, I don't think people who have charged them of doing that are being fair. Um, one thing I really like about this report, you know, there, there were a couple of comments. Power grab, uh, what, do whatever they want. I'm sorry, Th these comments are too little and too late and not founded in what I saw this commission do. In fact, I was there uh, at, on their last meeting going into towards midnight and they went page by page in this report, page by page, and were thoughtful and deliberate in doing this report. I urge you to adopt the report. Uh, there may uh, need to be some minor changes, but really implement it and then evaluate it. Use evidence. That's what we do in public health. We need that. And um, uh, I really like the empowerment to the community, this one-step process, and uh, the independence that we need. We don't need duplication, and that's one thing this report uh, uh, recommends against. Thank you so much for listening, and uh, thanks for your service. Appreciate it. Does that complete public testimony? That completes testimony. All right, very good. Thank you, everybody who testified. That was uh, terrific testimony. I think we'll ask staff to come back up at this time. And before <coughs> I ask my colleagues if they have questions, Samir, could you just level set us here in terms of what the process is? Today, we're taking a vote to effectively receive the report. W what happens after that? Yes, yes, I can. Um, first, let me thank everyone who gave uh, thoughtful testimony uh, on the work of the PAC, um, regardless of what your opinions may be on it. Thank you for that. Um, to answer the question, um, this action is simply a decision of the city council to accept the report. Accepting the report does not mean uh, support or opposition to the specifics of the proposal. Following that, the PA, the sorry, the city council has 60 days. Um, and this is a process outlined in the settlement agreement, um, the amendments which were put into the record in April of 2022. The city council has 60 days in which to assess the proposals and develop uh, its proposals, uh, the city's proposals for what the city code should be, as well as settlement agreement amendments that would allow for the implementation of the oversight board and send both of those on uh, through a resolution I've been advised uh, of city council um, to the US Department of Justice and the US court. Following that, the US Department of Justice and US court will evaluate these proposals and that will likely include, although I can't be 100% certain, mediation. 
um, conversations uh, between these groups and eventually most likely a fairness hearing um, in the US court. That process under the settlement agreement does not have a deadline for the DOJ and the court. Um, that's not part of the settlement agreement. The deadlines are only on the city in the text. Um, but whenever that is concluded and there is text that has been uh, worked out through these uh, three entities, the city, the Department of Justice, and the, um, uh, the court, um, it comes back to the city council and the city council has 21 days in which to approve the city code. And my guess, and I'll direct more detail on this to the city attorneys, is that my guess is they'd have to vote on the, uh, that you'd have to vote on the city, um, on the settlement agreement amendments too at some point. Okay. Um, and that starts the one year implementation run up period at the end of up, up to one year at the end of which the new system needs to be set up and able to take in complaints. Okay, and I, I, I just wanted to sort of level set here and acknowledge number one that this committee's worked for a year, but we still have a long way to go. This, yes. this is an important waypoint, but it is only a waypoint. And then this council working with our staffs and legal counsel and advisors, we have a lot of work that we need to do in the next 60 days. And then there's an entire different process that engages the DOJ and others in the process as well. So I, I just wanted people to, to have that understanding. Uh, colleagues, any questions? I have some. I'll, I'll go ahead and start. And uh, first of all, I, I, uh, there, there's many, many things that I'm impressed by this report. I won't go into them all now since people have been sitting here for three hours, but I, I do have some questions that that were of interest to me. So the charter states that people who are currently or formerly employed by a law enforcement agency nor their immediate family members can be board members. And I understand that the PAC cannot change that. And they said that right up front, that that, that is what the charter change said. The voters believe that. But I believe based on my research that the PAC's definition of a law, law enforcement agency goes well beyond the definition provided in statute, and it even includes prosecutors. So I'm, I'm just curious to know, how did the PAC reach this particular definition, and what's the rationale for this definition versus, say, the statutory definition of what law enforcement is? Thank you for the question. I'll probably pass part of this to Commissioner Yume. Um, I, I did want to mention that there are multiple statutes in state law uh, that have their own definition of law enforcement agency. One of the ones that the PAC looked at under the uh, relevant ORS included any agency, any um, entity that hires even one police officer would be considered a law enforcement agency. And so that means that uh, a public university with university police would be considered a law enforcement agency and a person who had served on the janitorial staff 20 years ago would be considered a former employee of a law enforcement agency. There were also definitions that had a very different, more narrow scope on the other side and the PAC assessed all of those in developing its definition. In terms of why they chose it, I think um, I'll probably pass that over to Commissioner Yume here. Thanks, Samir. Um, you know, I think this is a slightly difficult question for me to answer as a late appointee to the board, um, but uh, so I was not there for the, all the deliberations on this question, but um, you know I think the board uh, spoke to community. Um, they asked for community input, you know, through public comment, um, through some of these panels that have been mentioned, and um, there was a, a very strong consensus uh, amongst people who weighed in on this issue that they wanted that full independence. And I think to Samir's point, the more you you know, split hairs about who's a law enforcement official and who's not, I think that gets very complicated and that speaks to legitimacy. Okay, and, and, and I, I appreciate that. So the charter prohibits, and again, your committee can't change charter. It's, that's what you were handed. Uh, the charter prohibits board members from having prior law experience, and that includes family relationships, but it does not prohibit staff of the board from having prior law enforcement or prosecutorial experience. But the PAC proposal goes even farther than the charter and it prohibits even staff of the board from having law enforcement experience. And we, we heard from some people who testified today that, that there needs to be somebody in this process who has that context or that understanding or experience. But even the, 
even the staff is prohibited. What, what was the rationale there? So just to clarify one thing, um, the proposal from the PAC is that um, the staff would not be able to be current or former police officers, um, which is a narrow. So it's specific to police yes. officers. Yes, and in terms could, of why. Could, could somebody think. explain that maybe for my, for my edification? Yes. Yeah. For the record, um, Catherine McDowell, former member of the commission, um, we, we did debate this robustly, and one of the things we decided to do to, um, you know, to, to ensure that we were following um, the will of the community and, and the will of the voters on this was in our various community engagement um, meetings to raise this with folks. So we specifically put that question out in our community engagement meetings. And I would say that, um, I mean, I came in not, not, you know, trying to understand was that, um, ambiguity about staff purposeful or not? Should we extend the prohibition on board service to staff or not? And through those community engagement um, meetings, we really got a, a lot of feedback around the importance of independence. And so folks were really, um, the feedback we got was in the same way that law enforcement should not sit on the board, nor should um, they staff the office. And so that's what we came up with, because the issue was um, an extension of, you know, was really caused us to have to interpret what was a, sort of an ambiguous part of the charter, we ended up narrowing it to police officers. So that's how we came out, and we really did come to that question with an open mind and look to the community to give us feedback on it. And I appreciate that answer. Uh, I, I was asked a question by somebody, what would current members of advisory groups, and as you know, we have a number of law enforcement advisory groups, would those members be barred from serving on the board if they have a relation who is a police officer? So the, the charter indicates that service on the board is prohibited for people who are family members of current law enforcement agency employees, but not for those who are family members of former law enforcement uh, okay, agency and what, employees. Okay, and what if they themselves have former affiliation with law enforcement? The, the charter language would prohibit that, okay. as is the advice that was that, given that to That was the my PAC. reading, but I, I just wanted to confirm that. And, and the reason um, I just pause for a moment is just to check on the restrictions on board membership. There is a recommendation in the code, um, proposed code language, that individuals who are currently members of another advisory group not also be eligible for board service on this group with really um, a recognition around the commitment that service on this group would okay. entail. That's helpful. Uh, and, and this one was, was curious to me as well. The, the charter, and again, you can't control the charter, the charter requires the physical location of the board office to be outside of a Portland Police Bureau facility. But uh, that being the case, the PAC has still broadened that to include any agency that has a law enforcement or public safety component and elected officials other than the auditor. Can, can you explain the rationale behind that? I, I was just curious as to how the committee got to that conclusion. Yeah, so my uh, recollection of that conversation is it flowed out of the same time frame that the PAC was discussing the definition of independent judgment. Um, and it, that occurred around the same time frame um, as the oversight staff uh, subcommittee was meeting and deciding on it. And those two kind of conversations were in parallel with each other in terms of when that happened. Um, so while I can't speak for the members, um, my uh, assessment of it, I believe it was that around the similar question about independence, that evaluation. But is that, is that an accurate statement? Yes, if, if you look at um, our definition of independent judgment, it is um, both the you know actual um, actual independence and the perception of independence. So I think we were concerned about um, perceptions and around um, how you know the community would come to trust the independence of this agency. So okay. that was um, I would say that that informed that recommendation. Okay, thank you. Um, there was a number, and, and colleagues, I only have a, a couple more. Um, th th 
there was some testimony with regard to access to highly confidential information, and I, I think most people here who know me well know that is a very touchy subject for me. Uh, what kind of background checks will be required for board and staff to access database information like the regional justice information system region and the criminal justice information system, CJIS? What, what is legally required? What, what do you requiring and what is legally required? So the, uh, the, the database in question, uh, CJIS, it's, it's um, managed at the state level, um, but it, it has a state contact and it's, it's also, uh, that, that is, it's a federal database that's managed at the state level. So there's a state contact for every state. In the case of uh, Oregon, it's the Oregon State Police. They have a, uh, a employee at, at OSP who is the, the person that, that um, determines whether or not a person right. can. Right, I know. Yeah. So just to jump to the chase, uh, yeah. background checks are typically required to access that information. Yes. Will board members be required to go through background checks yes. in order to access any information coming from that system? Yes. That's a yes. The, and, and the presumptive uh, criteria is uh, people with a felony conviction generally are disqualified, although there is a process for appeal, um, but that is in the PAC's proposal. Uh, and that's that criteria that I just mentioned about a felony is is the uh, the CJIS requirement. Okay, and, and I think I'm going to wrap it up here, but I, I have sort of one more. It's a metal pretzel. I can't quite. I probably should have used a Gordian knot example Mayor, here instead I? of a pretzel, but you get my point. So, who is going to provide training to board members and staff about the Portland Police Bureau? Given that law enforcement is excluded from staff or the board? I have the answer, but did you want to say, okay, yeah. So the proposal indicates that, that current and former police officers cannot be staff. However, so there's a two-part answer. First, under the PAC's proposal, former employees or current employees of um, PPB that are not sworn officers are eligible to serve as staff. Um, I think that many of you may be familiar with employees at PPB and strategic services or their equity office or those other parts of the work that are very familiar with processes, their policy team, that there's a lot of different parts of PPB that aren't uh, sworn officers. So that's one <laughs> part of the answer. The other part is that the PAC's proposal allows for the hiring of experts um, on a, um, you know, a specific task basis as contractors to help with things including training and specifically including law enforcement experts is a quote from their proposal. Okay, thank you. Um, and thank you for your patience. I'll, I'll just make one other comment. It's something I'm going to think about and weigh over this 60 day period. And you'll recall the, the last time we had a public conversation about this many weeks ago, uh, I said legitimacy was extremely important to me. This has to be seen as a legitimate body by the community at large. And I remain, I'll say, uh, curious slash concerned about the exclusion of law enforcement from a, an accountability organization that is about law enforcement. And so it seems to me that excluding, if I could use the analogy, people with direct context from the jury pool who are trying cases related to that very same population, in my mind there's a disconnect that I can't quite reconcile. And so it's something I'm gonna be thinking about going forward. There, there's, there's a fairness issue here that I can't get around based on what I'm seeing so far. It, 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 could, could somebody help me make that leap? If, if you exclude the policing perspective from an accountability board that's making decisions about police, how do you reconcile that? And if you broaden that to other contexts in the community, you would see fairly quickly that it looks like an unjust system that's being created. I see, I just saw on the screen that, that a commission member uh, raised their hand, so maybe I'll, I'll defer to commission member Dan first and then I can add anything. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Mayor. Uh, so the way the system works now, and you heard some testimony about this, is that when there's a, a police review board held, um, the person who was uh, saying that they were harmed by the police or their loved ones are not allowed into those hearings right now. 
that the majority of the people on that board are uh, police officers. Uh, and I think, as you know, uh, in the police review board system, the training division offers an analysis of whether or not the policies and training were followed correctly. Uh, the PAC's proposal maintains that training division personnel being part of every hearing and advising the board about what the police did, whether or not what they did followed policy. That is part of the proposal for all the hearings. So all right. That and, helps. All right. Th thanks, Dan. I'll, I'll consider that and I'll, I'll stop at this point. I don't know if my colleagues have any other thoughts. Uh, it's been a long afternoon. Thank you, everybody. Thanks for those uh, of you who are panelists, everybody who testified. This was, was an excellent conversation. Uh, this is a report. I think I have, I have a few. You covered oh, Dan, I'm sorry I didn't see yeah. your hand raised. Um, first of all, thank Ryan. you. I mean, this was a, yeah, it was a great report, and I keep noodling through it. And um, <clears throat> under the structure and details section of the board membership in the PACS report, there's a mention of a support structure designated to assist board members in meeting its diversity and representation objectives, and in that the structure aims to foster equity and address challenges potential board members might face due to socioeconomic conditions, mental health issues, and other factors. It goes on to say this includes a modest compensation package for volunteers, reimbursement for costs incurred by the volunteers, and mental health support. Could you elaborate on what is meant by mental health support in this context? The um, proposal, uh, there's a, uh, much of this didn't end up in the code proposal, but it's, it's explained in the areas of agreement of the PAC uh, a little bit more, which is a whole other section of the document. And again, I, I want to recognize it's a very long document. The uh, proposal was to look into something similar to an EAP, or Employee Assistance Program, um, that can help connect uh, members of the new Oversight Board to resources. Um, that may be able to help them. And I know that that's something that um, was being looked into, um, but I, I think it'll take quite a while to look into by um, other parts of the city that focus on those things, namely the city attorney's office and human resources. Um, and, and so it was like a newly really... introduced benefit package and was the HR department involved in this? Formulation. Um, the Bureau of Human Resources was consulted and they, they were sent uh, things. They did not respond on this particular question, but I do know, again, separately, the city attorney's office was advised um, on it, and um, I think they did provide legal advice that I think is, is uh, relevant to this. I, I don't know if I'm able to say more on that, but um, I'm sure that they would be willing to give a, a briefing to counsel to help with uh, what understanding what legal advice was given. Samir, if I might add, I think, you know, a lot of that language is what they say enabling language, right? It allows for those uh, options to be available. It doesn't necessarily specify you have to provide X and Y, right? Um, also, just as an aside, in, in public comment, someone mentioned that, you know, volunteers shouldn't have to do this work. And at some level, I'm sympathetic to it as someone who does the work. But uh, we ask them to do this work now without compensation and without mental health support and with what is quite frankly a very heavy caseload. In between preparing for this presentation, I uh, went into an officer involved shooting police review board and before I went into it, they said, can you do another one in two weeks, right? That's the caseload that we currently we currently work with. And just to add one thing to, to that aside, the um, body worn camera, uh, program is being implemented now, so that will increase the, the types of information that uh, volunteers will be asked to review. The, the mayor touched on <clears throat> much of my questioning and reflection over the next uh, 60 days, and that has to do with those with professional experience and background. And I'll, I have a lot written down here, but the mayor covered a lot of it. I was confused about, um, so if you've been retired from law enforcement for 10 years, that, that was excluded as well? To clarify, so it's, it's not from... just currently in law enforcement. It's if you've ever been involved with law enforcement, period. You could be retired for X amount of years, and that doesn't, you, you're not qualified, or you're not allowed to participate. Uh, participate in what? As a board? Be on the, the board. Cor yeah. Correct. That, and that's the charter language that, that the, it did, does say former uh, law enforcement agency employees are not eligible to serve. Um, and that, again, that's not something that the PAC discussed. It's just the, the advice that the um, city attorney's office gave in a public meeting about what that means. So we didn't broaden the scope of the definition. That was all in the charter that, that we could have seen in the voters' pamphlet. 
Yes. Okay. I think what a lot of us are, what I'm doing is, you know, 82% of Portlanders voted for this, and I do think that of those 82%, some are caught off guard by some of the details that were revealed in this report today. So that's why we're, and my experience in life with um, having objectivity and insight at the table, I'll just say in education, it was really wonderful to always have like a retired teacher, retired superintendent. They um, were not on the clock anymore. <laughs> They're not um, engaged with the union any longer, if you will, and they just offered such tremendous insight. So I do, I am concerned that we don't have that perspective at the table. And I think, it, I think a lot of voters were caught off guard by that. So, um, so I was questioning if we broaden that definition, but it, it is in the it is it was in the voters pamphlet. Yeah, the exact quote is: "People who were formerly employed by a law enforcement agency are not eligible for service on the board." End quote. Okay. Um, <clears throat> and then it gets kind of nuanced, but. Um, so I've come across a volunteer graffiti removal initiative spearheaded by Salem Police and with the goal of removing graffiti from public spaces. Um, if an individual were to volunteer for this initiative, would their volunteer employment status render them or their family ineligible to participate in Police Accountability Commission? No. Okay, so that's a nuance. Yeah, they, they wouldn't be an employee, so, um, and the PAC So the key word is volunteer. A family member, they weren't employed. A family a, member of a current employee, the, okay. the, the, the person affiliated with police, that's the requirement. And I, I think the city attorneys are probably um, maybe the best place to get the exact where to draw the line on that. Splitting hairs a bit, just try to make sure that we have the opportunity to get <laughs> the most diverse insight possible. Sure. So then if you're a spouse of a retired member of law enforcement, you're eligible to apply. Again, my understanding of the charter, and again, the city attorneys are probably the best for this, is that a spouse of a former law enforcement agency employee is not eligible for service given the charter text. And again, none of this was a, the PAC didn't even discuss the, the, the whether or not they um, you know, supported or did not support this. It was a given that they had to work within. Okay, great. Just wanted to get all it about here, why you're here, to be transparent, the stuff that I want to noodle with. Um, the question may seem unrelated, but the budget associated with the PAC has always been, I think, on everyone's mind. Um, and I know it's a big concern for the council as we try to figure out all of our budget challenges, especially during this time of transition. Do community safety division staff or the PAC members provide any guidance on where council can reappropriate monies for the PAC's $12 million budget? The CSD and the PAC did not develop any guidance on that. I will say that the settlement agreement does indicate that at some point IPR will stop taking on new cases and have to complete their existing work. And as a result, there are built-in offsets that, I mean, that, that I think it's widely accepted and, and you may, may be able to correct me that IPR and the Citizen Review Committee will at some point in this process um, conclude their work and that is uh, an offset. So it's not all new spending, there is spending that would be replaced in part, it, not, not all of it, but some of it, the, the IPR budget, for example, um, would be a, a funding obligation that no longer exists in a couple of years. Is there a recommendation to adjust the initially recommended 5% budget? Uh, again, that was part of the, the charter, so that the commission did not discuss the merit of anything in the charter. They, they worked within it as the council resolutions asked them to do All so. Right. Just seeing if you dove into what will be a very hard assignment, I and mean, we'd love to hear any of your thoughts, but you didn't touch that. Correct. I, I, I will say just um, because this relates to, to your question, Commissioner, but also to some of the public comment that the council will need to evaluate the budget request each year. It will need to go through all the normal processes that a, a budget request from any bureau goes to. There is this one additional requirement in charter of a floor. Yeah. Um, but it is subject to all the same scrutiny that this new bureau will be subject to audits, including by the city auditor follow all the procurement rules, all of those things that relate to budgetary oversight that every other part of the city um, 
has to abide by, um, this new system would need to abide by as well. I'm just curious, when you made more restrictions on who could serve on the board, was it in community engagement? Where, where did that come from? But it, it evolved where it seems like it became more um, ex, um, exclusive. Not as many people could, could apply than it was even in the charter. What, how did that come about with the consensus of the board, of the volunteers? It just seemed like it became more restricted as this process went along. I'm not sure that there were additional restrictions on. Maybe it's your interpretation is very pure <laughs> in, in how you define law enforcement. Yeah, and just to clarify, because this relates to the mayor's uh, question earlier exactly. as well, um, that the, the definition that the PAC used for a law enforcement agency, I'm just gonna pull it up here. Um, there's a sort of a short form of it um, agencies that primarily employ police officers, corrections officers, or prosecutors. And then there's some explanatory text. Um, I, I think in terms of the rationale, that's probably better if either commissioner would like to speak to it. And public defenders included as well? No. Okay. You know, I think um, we really, as far as the board um, service, I think we were really just trying to adhere to the language of the charter. Um, I think the area where it was ambiguous and we saw it, community input was on the staff. And so that is um, an issue that was open. We were, I think we went into it open-minded, sought community input and ended up um, restricting uh, police officers, but not applying that broad law enforcement definition. And I, I will say while we're yeah. on the topic both of, um, you know, using uh, police and former police, their expertise, their guidance for okay. training, for context, um, I really would encourage you to read the code because there's many places where um, we have tried within the um, framework of the charter, which does really um, put a premium on independence, figure out how to bring in that law enforcement expertise. So we recommend that somebody from the trainings division be at each hearing as a resource. We, um, even though we recommended against employment of um, police officers or former police officers on staff, we did um, recommend that um, the commission be allowed to um, retain um, those folks as experts and um, both for training and for purposes of uh, um, pursuing cases. And then um, we also have language in there that really stresses the importance of developing working relationships with um, law enforcement, including an expectation that members of law enforcement, the police chief, um, and others would be um, regularly invited to board meetings and communicate informally and formally with members of the board. So I think we're envisioning that while but these folks may not actually be members of the, um, the board or staff, um, hired as staff, we would have a professional ongoing relationship and that was codified in our recommendations that um, folks be, that these productive working relationships be maintained. And just to add to this, because this also relates to the question that the mayor asked about um, background checks, um, that the background check answer from before was the requirement for access to um, the databases. But there's also in the PAC's proposal a requirement that if the background check indicates any reason that a person, uh, an applicant for the board, um, might have a um, an inability to be fair and impartial because of a bias for or against the police, that that person would be, uh, that, that that background check would, would indicate that and that would be passed on to the appointing authority, which is the city council, as a reason not to appoint them. Um, because that, that would also uh, relate to the due process and, and all that um, sort of requirements of upholding a fair process for officers, which is their right. A curious question. Um, Pat, why are you working on this report? You put so many hours into it. Did you also include insights at, in, ter in terms of doing ride along um, with the police officers during this journey? The members that produced this report? 
did you lean into that and you know have an opportunity to put yourself in their shoes? So I, I will say, um, you know, there were so many, so many aspects of this report that um, you know we had to address. So much work to be done, and one of the things we were constantly looking at is: do we make a recommendation on this issue, or do we, you know, make a general statement on, you know, for example, board members have required training, and part of that training is familiarity with the operations of the Portland Police Bureau. We ended up there, and of course, the we also recommended that the board. Um, have the ability to create its own rules and policies with the idea there is a training mandate, there is a training mandate specific to Portland Police Bureau operations and policies, and then we um, decided to leave it open for the board itself to make determinations around, I mean, we really tried not to get down to the detailed level of, for example, requiring ride-alongs. We just thought, some of this was best left to the board itself as a part of their implementation and uh, obviously with guidance from this council. And if I might add, um, Commissioner Ryan, uh, having, as a member of the CRC, I've gone on a ride along and I found it very limited. Um, so I, I can see the value to it. I think two things that occur to me, um, one is that you know when doing that, you sign a release that says that if you are injured or killed <laughs> on that ride along, you uh, hold the city harmless, right? And so um, that's, a, I think, an interesting thing to mandate that someone take on that risk, right? Um, some community members expressed concern about um, you know, the, those experiences also being re-traumatizing if they have lived experience with police. But a thing that stands out to me is something that um, Nathan Castle from the Tactical, I, I know the acronym, I apologize, TAC, uh, I think it's the Tactical Trading Advisory, Trading Advisory Council. Um, you know, one of the things that they mentioned when they, talk, when they gave testimony about um, you know, not subsuming all the functions of every advisory body, which is, I believe, a question that council asked of the PAC, uh, is that the, this new body is primarily a disciplinary body, right? Um, the TAC, uh, the Training Advisory uh, Board, is an advisory body, right? And so they wouldn't want to take on those disciplinary roles uh, and risk damaging that relationship between officers and the people that advise them. And I think the inverse can sometimes be true, which is, um, you know, I went on a ride along, you know, what happens if that officer uh, you know, is involved in an officer-involved shooting. Am I going to have to accuse myself? Will that be injurious to the to the uh, bureau? Right? Like, um, that's and at some level deprives the officer of a right to due process as well. So I think it's a it's a delicate balancing act. And fundamentally, given the time constraints, that's why there is not a definitive recommendation from the PAC. Commissioner Gonzalez. I'll just. Yeah, uh, I'll keep it brief. With respect to ballot measure 26217, just to be crystal clear upon the record, you, your body did not identify any um, fundamental weaknesses in the ballot measure. You didn't assess ambiguities per se or, or problems with the, the, with the ballot measure, correct? That was not a, a part of your deliverable. That is correct. There are two or three places where it says as required or as defined in city code. And because the PAC is required to submit a city code proposal, they did try to answer those. For example, the length of a term is okay. as defined. Yeah. And I, I just want to uh, put on the record, I, I had made both in private and in other uh, instances a specific request that the, the body identify problem if there were problems in the ballot measure that that there be some sort of identification of that. So uh, I'm disappointed that it's not included. I, I, I understand, uh, but uh, just want to put that on the record, a little disappointed that we couldn't, because when you get to implementation, right, you guys are in a unique position to assess uh, the effectiveness of the original drafting. And sometimes things become apparent as you're trying to operationalize something that weren't apparent when you initially draft. And so um, I think that's a missed opportunity. I would encourage future boards when we're implementing ballot measures to take that space because it certainly is assistance to us as we, you know, accept your report, hear it out. But you're in a unique position to identify problems in the original ballot measure that are just not self-evident to folks when they vote. 
leave it at that. And I, I uh, wanted to just mention, I missed a paragraph in my notes when we were doing this, and it was right around the uh, self-assessment part, and it relates to something that Commissioner Yume just talked about, that the, the PAC did recommend a, a self-assessment, including of the overarching framework to take place, uh, I think it's two years after implementation, mm -hmm. so that after the initial, uh, the, the dust has settled, um, that there can be that level of evaluation of, uh, they, they mentioned a few things in that, to submit to council to consider, and that might include charter, it might also include city code or anything else, um, uh, to, to try and ensure that there is that self-assessment after implementation when there's data. Okay, appreciate it, thank you. Great, anything else? We have two amendments on the table. The first was to replace the Police, Accounty, Police Accountability Commission report with the final draft. Any further discussion on the amendment? Seeing none, please call the roll. Gonzalez? Aye. Maps? Aye. Rubio? I, I want to thank uh, the volunteers and staff of the PAC for showing such thoroughness and commitment uh, that went into the creation of this report and the recommendations and, and, whoops, and all the thousands of hours uh, that you gave. I want to acknowledge that work. Um, I also want to acknowledge that some of my questions um, on certain items were demystified in the presentation, so that was really helpful to hear you present the whole whole thing. Um, for me, I just want you all to know I'll be looking to ensure that we're meeting the intent of the voters um, and the ballot measure as clearly as possible, while also oh, thinking too. operationally about se sequencing and authority. Um, and that's why I'm just really grateful for all the public testimony today, um, including hearing more of the personal testimonies. And also want to thank the partners, including the amici, for their time and input as well. Um, I vote aye. Thank you. Ryan? Amendments, right? Aye. Wheeler? All right, the amendment's adopted. Next amendment was to include the Police Accountability Commission final city code recommendations. Gonzalez? Aye. Maps? Aye. Rubio? Aye. Ryan? Aye. Wheeler? Aye. The amendment Aye. is adopted. I'll now entertain a motion to accept the report as amended. So moves. Commissioner Maps moves. Can I get a second? Second. Commissioner Gonzalez seconds. Any further discussion on the report as amended? Seeing none, please call. The Gonzalez? I would like to thank all those who served on the PAC. I know your work was a huge lift and took up many evenings from your friends and family. We still volunteered, you stepped up, and for that, you deserve our gratitude. I want to thank especially Samir uh, for all your work on staffing the commission and all that, that that entails. I am voting today to accept today's report. I think it is important we as elected officials show fidelity to the spirit of what voters approved in 2020, as well as our agreement with the DOG, DOJ. That is a call for police accountability. But I also believe it is essential to put on the record some of my very serious concerns with ballot measure 26217 and certain aspects of the recommendation from the PAC today. Our city is in a public safety crisis. You can see it every day on the streets of our city. Mon more fundamentally, we are facing a crisis of confidence, of faith that our system will bring criminals to justice. We are a far cry from November 2020, when ballot measure 26217 passed in the city of Portland. My first job as commissioner is to make sure that this city and its staff have the tools to be successful. So I want to be very clear. I will not support defunding the Portland Police Bureau. I will not support putting in place a system that makes it more difficult to recruit police officers to our city. I also will not support establishment of a system that enables witch hunts. Lady justice is depicted in blindfolds to assure objectivity and impartiality. Exclusions of law enforcement employees and family members, specifying that those who have experienced over-policing but not those that have experienced under-policing from the oversight board are but a few examples of putting fingers on the scale of abdication and the responsibility to assure objectivity and impartiality. The next 60 days are going to be time for me and my colleagues and staff to process the report before us and chart the best path forward for our city. I want to, want to once again thank you all for your service. I vote to accept the report. Thank you. Maps. Um, I want to thank everyone who testified today. Uh, this was a really rich dialogue, 
and I also want to thank the Police Accountability Commission for their work, and I want to thank them for this report. Um, in addition, I want to recognize staff who supported the commission in their work. Um, I've been around for a while. I know I have a sense of how challenging it is to navigate this space, um, and uh, uh, um, Samir in particular has done uh, uh, amazing work keeping this conversation moving forward. Um, and now we enter the next phase of Portland's ongoing efforts to make sure that our public safety system is fair and accountable for everybody. So over the next two months, I look forward to working with my colleagues on council to move public safety reform forward here in Portland, which is why I vote to accept this report. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Thank you. Rubio. Um, hi, and sorry, I, I messed up earlier and started my comments early, but so I, I apologize if I'm redundant, but um, just want to say again that, um, you know, voters approved the measure um, in 2020, and now it requires the city to stand up this new system that embodies independent judgment, centers community, and also embodies legitimacy and fairness, as you mentioned in your report. Um, and I want to thank you again uh, for all the tremendous work and the commitment to, to the, the creation of this report that went into it. Samir, um, thank you so much for always being available to answer questions and for leading uh, the group as you have. Also, Victoria, for the hours of work she put in as well. Um, want to make sure to acknowledge her there. Um, so now we have a big task ahead and 60 days to accomplish this. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, um, for me, I'll be looking to ensure that, of course, we're meeting intent um, while also, also thinking about sequencing and um, authority. For example, what belongs in code versus what should be up to the new commission to decide um, and adopt. And of course, um, ensuring transparency and legality and what is fair and just. Um, Again, really grateful for all the public testimony, all the <clears throat> written comments that we've received for today and also over the last few years of, about this, um, this work. Um, and I also, again, want to acknowledge the amici uh, for their ongoing work. As Dr. Haynes and Pastor Weisner both said earlier, this is work that's been decades in the making and deserves to be engaged with as such. So I vote aye. Ryan. Yes, I want to begin my remarks by extending a heartfelt gratitude to the Police Accountability Commission. Your dedication to serving our beloved city of Portland for the past two years has not gone unnoticed. I've been to just a couple of your meetings and I was always in awe of how many hours you were putting into this. I really deeply value the time, energy, and focus you brought to this work. I see you and I appreciate you. And those must be your children behind you, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, two birthdays, children, this is great. You, re you really did humanize yourselves today. I kind of wish we would have done this earlier. Um, additionally, I'd like to acknowledge the tireless efforts of the Community Safety Division Deputy Director Elizabeth Perez, Advisory Boards and, Com and Commissioner Manager Samir Kanal. Uh, Samir, my team and I have been in the privilege of collaborating with you numerous times, and you've been always very present and always very responsive, so thank you. I hope that you um, have a little bit of a breather after this. In addition, I want to acknowledge my senior policy director, Darian Jones, who has been engaging in this work over two years. I just want Darian to know your extra hours on this assignment is deeply appreciated. The Charter for PAC was established by Portland voters with a distinct mission to shape the future of police oversight in Portland. Their charge is to help define a new system to help investigate areas of misconduct, by our police bureau and provide recommendations on police practices and directives, always with an emphasis on community engagement. I'm convinced that this committee is striving for the revamped police oversight system, a system that not only holds our officers accountable, but also fosters opportunities for training, learning, and strengthening the bond, the necessary bond between community members and law enforcement, building trust for authentic police reforms. I also think it's noteworthy that 82% of the voters who supported this initiative included members of our very own police bureau, uh, people who are a part of business associations, people who are part of neighborhood associations, people who you heard from today who voted yes for improved accountability, and yet would agree that this is not perfect. Simply put, we will need to do some edits as we move forward towards implementation. I understand that the Charter of Voters approved restricts memberships to the board from police people currently employed 
by law enforcement agencies and their immediate family members are not eligible for service on the board and people formerly employed by law enforcement agency are not eligible for service on the board. Inclusion for me means offering everyone a seat at the table. For instance, the board of a nursing disciplinary committee includes a nurse. Bar associations discipline committees uh, pr predominantly consist of current or former attorneys. Medical review boards incorporate medical professionals. As such, I have a request that those engaged in this work going forward, please sign up for police ride-alongs. I mentioned that earlier. Anyway, I just think we need to go deeper into more insight and move forward with more empathy as we do this work. As a proud Portlander, I understand the significance of the system's legitimacy, especially for those most affected, which is most of us who want to feel safe and know that we trust law enforcement in my community. I'll tell you, as a queer elder who's lived with HIV for a significant portion of my life, I've experienced and witnessed directly bias and over-policing in New York City in the 80s, in Seattle in the 90s, and yes, in Portland in um, the late 90s and early aughts especially. It's imperative for the vitality of the city that we all get this right for every Portlander. I have faith in my fellow council members, our staff, and I will utilize the PAC's recommendations to get this across the finish line with the DOJ. The next 60 days are going to be crucial for our work. Volunteer leaders, thank you. Thank you so much for your hard work. You provided a, a, a foundation as we move forward. I will digest the balance of the test, the balanced testimony today. It was really balanced and that was very refreshing. Uh, and I will keep listening to the 82% who supported this measure and I will lean into making thoughtful edits with my colleagues in the next 60 days. Here's to community policing and authentic peace force that will allow us to feel safe as they serve and protect those who obey the law and bring much needed positivity to our city. I do receive, I accept, and appreciate this report. I Wheeler. So the commission held around 130 meetings, resulting in 96 pages of proposed code and a final report of over 500 pages. Let's all be clear. This was a formidable undertaking, and I want to acknowledge that this no doubt resulted in many personal sacrifices in your daily lives, and I don't think that gets acknowledged often enough. I want to be transparent that I do have concerns with some aspects of these extensive recommendations. I believe that all of us at the Council truly recognize the importance of ensuring that this system is, in fact, in alignment with the charter reform that the voters, as you indicated, overwhelmingly supported. Through that lens, the Council must consider these recommendations while also analyzing for aspects that may go beyond the charter authority are incongruent with governing law or may be better suited to operational documents rather than city code. We have a lot of work ahead of us as we move this process forward to ensure legitimacy, legality, and fairness for all concerned. That being said, I want to be unequivocally clear that I do appreciate your hard work and I do appreciate your sacrifice and I sincerely thank you for your service. I want to also recognize that there were a number of diligent professional staff who worked alongside the Commission. Thank you to our facilitators, our interpreters, our community events organizers for your support and your hard efforts. And I want to thank Austin Foster, Jamie Ridgway, and Emily Mann for their work staffing the Commission, hundreds and hundreds of hours. And last but not least, I want to thank you, Samir. You facilitated this process from the beginning and it served as uh, an important process and you have been a dedicated champion for the PAC. I want to thank you for your strong leadership here. I vote aye. The report is accepted as amended. We're adjourned and it's dinner time. Thank you.